Okay, we've got the thumbs up. We're going to go and call this meeting to order, the regular scheduled city council meeting on July the 12th. is about 7 after 7. Madam Clerk, would you please uh, give us a roll call? Councilman Jindal. Present. Councilman Lenart. Here. Councilman Rigsby. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Daly. Here. Mayor Duper. Present. We have a quorum. Thank you. The council did meet uh, for closed session beginning at 6 o'clock, and I'll ask the city attorney to report out on that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, yes, we received information on the matter and direction was given to staff. And other than that, I have nothing else to report. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll move on to the invocation and pledge of allegiance by Dr. Lenart. Pledge allegiance to the flag of America and it stands one heart, indivisible, justice for all. Okay, at this time, uh, we would invite anyone from the public that wishes to speak on any non agendized item, opportunity to do so. And I believe I have two. If you do wish to speak, just come forward and submit a card. Mr. Richard Frost. If you would, when you step forward, if you'd please uh, uh, give your name, your address, and uh, go ahead and uh, speak for us. Uh, uh, Richard Frost, uh, 12731 um, Third Street in Yucaipa. Um, th this involves so something that happened in uh, Loma Linda. I was on July 2nd, I was at the bus stop at, um, on Redlands Boulevard and Bryn Mawr over by the Redlands um, Ambulatory Care Center. And I was told that's in Loma Linda, and I checked the map, it is. And there was a white dog, um, it was loose, older white dog uh, with no collar on, just went across the street, just didn't pay, pay, pay attention to the cars, and it went way over a block or two away, and then came back again, and just almost got hit. And um, after what, I called uh, animal control, and I, I was trying to find out what happened to the dog, if they caught it or not, or if it belonged to somebody. And uh, I was just wondering, because I know it's a small town, and somebody might, might have noticed the, the dog. And if it was, uh, didn't have an owner or something like that, is it possible to adopt it if it was a stray dog, if they even found it? Uh, uh, that was me. What we'll do is if you would uh, leave your phone number and your name, we'll have somebody from the city uh, follow up with you with uh -huh. the answer to that. We're, we're not sure, we're, we're not apprised of those type of things, but somebody from the city staff will get back with you. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Okay, Mr. Michael McDaniel. Good evening, Mr. Mayor. I'm Michael McDaniel, 26506 Poppy Court here in Loma Linda. I'm the Director of Donor Recruitment Council for Lifestream Blood Bank. I'd like to provide the city a brief update on the status of our blood supply as well as some blood drives that we're running um, at LLUH through July. So unfortunately, we are back down to the levels that we saw in December when the American Red Cross declared a national blood emergency. Um, we are officially declaring this a crisis. We are less than two days on hand and we have less than half a day on hand of O negative. Um, I do like to put a face to these things. This is baby Jessica. Baby Jessica is a remarkable story. She was born two months ago at LLUH at one pound, six ounces, 23 weeks and five days. Um, she has survived a heart surgery, uh, sepsis, as, and pneumonia, and received 10 blood transfusions. She is still under care at Loma Linda, and I'm happy to report she is on room air and formula now at 2 pounds and 15 ounces. So these are the patients that we are trying to support as the nonprofit blood bank for the Inland Empire for over 70 years. Um, I was just here, or am here, to encourage the council to uh, support our blood drives at LLUH and help us get that word out. Um, we will continue those drives through July and most likely through August. I'm happy to answer any questions if you may have them. I, I know you have a, a bus that you take out because I've planted myself in there multiple times, but it's been a while, so I'm, I'm due to drain a little of my blood. Um, 
do you have a schedule online or someplace of where that bus is going to be? And I know that in the past, there have been times when you've put it up in our city parking lot too. I don't know what the, you know, what kind of, of a crowd you've had lining up to contribute, but, uh, you know, we'd like to offer our parking lot too for it. We have people coming for COVID tests and library and all kinds of other things. So I think it would, at least on occasion, be a good site. It certainly would. In fact, some of our most successful drives are supported by cities. Um, the city of Chino Hills supports a monthly drive that's doing quite well, and our drives here have done well. So I would uh, welcome that opportunity. Um, you can find all of our information for scheduling at lstream.org. We run over 1,600 mobile blood drives annually to get those 500 pints a day that it takes to support the local hospitals. Um, a quick word of note, LLUH uses approximately 30,000 units of blood a year, and we are that pl primary supplier. Just uh, one more time plug for uh, those that are watching the, the website and the addresses and some of that stuff. Right, so go you can go to lstream.org. There you can uh, book your appointment at any of our 10 fixed site locations, including San Bernardino and Riverside, closest here. You can also schedule your appointment at a mobile drive, including the drives that we're running Monday through Friday during normal business hours, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. at Loma Linda University Health. And, Thank and you so can much. Can you tell us what blood types do you t are you typically running low on? I think OPAS is the universal... Oh, it's O negative, this universal donor? Oh. Anybody okay. can receive O positive. That's what we use in traumas. When, o uh, positive. Yes, when they don't have uh, time to test uh, right. your blood. Uh, we have about a day and a half of that on hand, and we are at uh, less than half a day of O neg. O neg is used in infants and birthing mothers primarily. That's the one that's most critical right now. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you for coming out. One back. question. Can you comment on some, uh, like, are there any contraindications like age? Age related can be you have to be above a certain age, below a certain age, uh, vaccination status, uh, COVID status. Because people ask me that all the time, I say I don't know. I'm not, I just, while you're here, I'll ask you. Well, thank you for the question. I'm happy to dispel a couple of myth, myths while I'm here. The minimum age in California with parental consent is 15, 15 and 16 with parental consent, 17 and up. In fact, we've had two donors over the age of 100 the, um, that have donated blood, so there is no maximum age there. Um, people even with diabetes, as long as it's controlled, can be. Uh, tattoos are a common myth. Um, as long as it's healed. You ha can have had it, been vaccinated, not vaccinated, that doesn't matter to us. Um, and another one I get asked often now is marijuana. Um, we don't care. Um, and it, <laughs> trust me, it doesn't matter for the blood. So um, you can donate even if uh, you had a little brownie before. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for coming out. Okay, anyone else with a non-agendized item? Seeing nobody rush forward, we'll move on uh, to our scheduled items. And what we're gonna go ahead and do, uh, because we've got, um, looks like a crowd here interested in, in some of these things, we're gonna move item five and item six up and do them first. So, Mr. City Manager. Uh, Lorena, this is the community. Uh, development <coughs> item. Lorena, can you present this for me, please? <coughs> yes, give me a moment. Okay, so we have item number four on the screen. We're okay with that? So uh, right. item number four is the last, the a annexation yes. issue. It, do it, we need it, to ha it, handle them in any? Yes, particular? it's the same. It's the same applicant. Okay. Four, five, and six, the same applicants. So you want to just take it all at once in, in that order? Yes. Okay, that's fine. I have three public hearing presentations today, so I'll try to be quick. So my name is Lorena Matarita. I am the senior planner for the city of Loma Linda. Um, and tonight's request is going to be a, a request to allow LAFCO to take proceedings to annex. So what's going before you today for my first public hearing presentation is a resolution of application requesting that the Local Agency Formation Commission to take proceedings for the future annexation of 141 acres within the sphere of influence area that's located on the eastern side of Loma Linda. 
Basically, by approving this tonight, you are giving city staff and LAFCO, the Local Agency Formation Commission, permission to start the process. So why do we want to start this process? Because currently, the applicant Hyde Point um, has submitted two single-family residential subdivision projects, and a part of those projects include four applications, but we can't proceed until we get permission to start working from LAFCO from you. Um, and, and also, if you see on the right and on the screen, that is the 141 acres that are, are currently in question. And within, highlighted in, in the black outline, dashed black outline, those are going to be the future subdivision projects. It's going to be for a 37 unit project and an 89 unit project. Again, that's not going before the council tonight. Tonight, it's just the permission to get LAFCO to get started on this. And the reason why we annex the entire area and not just the uh, proposed subdivisions is because we're not allowed to create annex, we're not allowed to create island territory, so we just annex the entire wedge as much as we can at one time. So the setting, it is located south of Barton Road, west of Santa Mateo Creek Road and Nevada Street, and approximately, and north of Beaumont Avenue, more or less, and east of the railroad tracks. Currently, as stated before, it is within the county sphere of influence. That's the reason why we have to annex it. And the current zone is under their zoning designations, rural living. Out of the 141 acres, approximately 65 acres are developed with residential, religious assembly, a wellness facility, flood control facilities, and less than 2% of that is used for agriculture. The remainder parcels are vacant and are intended for that future residential development that we are currently calling Canyon Ranch. The 141 acres also includes a total of 51 parcels and nine registered voters. The area is pre-zoned by the city of Loma Linda. What you see on the screen are the pre-zones. Up on the northern side, you're gonna see general commercial. In the middle yellow half is low density residential, that is our R1 zoning. And in the green area is what we call very low density residential. So the applicant will be coming at a later time, probably in about four to five months from now, uh, requesting a zoning change in order to propose that it's in that red area. It's highlighted in the blue diagonal lines. And per, per his future proposal, he will be required to install backbone improvements and connect with the city's current wet utilities, as well as do street improvements to support the overall future development. So LAFCO does require us to do a plan for service, a fiscal analysis, as we start these proceedings for annexation. So that is included in your staff report tonight. And I can tell you, based on the assumptions about the future development, in the annexation area, the annexation would have a positive fiscal impact on the city. So we can see a approximately a $220,000 reoccurring uh, surplus in Loma Linda once we annex it. Upon annexation, property owners would work with the city, not the county, to obtain city services um, and permits such as trash or building permits. And they will have the choice to hook up to our system and if, if they choose to do so, we would as assist them and issue the permits from now on. In terms of the environmental review, the CEQA requirements, we did work with the consultant to draft an initial study for the proposed project, and it will be reviewed by LAFCO during this process. The initial study, once um, it's reviewed by LAFCO and city staff, we will start a public review period, potentially in August or in September of, of this year as we move the process forward. As of now, the draft initial study has not identified any potentially, potentially significant impacts that could not be mitigated to less than significant, significant level. So part of the process of this requ request is having a public hearing notice published in the newspaper, which it was on June 20th in the Sun newspaper, and the notice itself was public at three was posted at three public locations. This item was also presented at yesterday's planning commission meeting, and public did provide comments and staff did did respond, and we were able to resolve most of their comments and concerns. So once the proceedings request is approved by council tonight, then we were authorizing LAFCO to do their process and they also have public hearings and send out notices and um, will notify the actual property owners within the area. 
And after LAFCO completes their process, we will once again come with the development project application as well as the official city annexation application before the Planning Commission and before this council. So again, what we're coming before tonight is just permission to work with LAFCO and at a later time, once LAFCO reviews the maps and the legal descriptions, then we will come before you with the Canyon Ranch development project and annexation application. So tonight, staff and the Planning Commission are making the following recommendation to Council. We would like you to approve the resolution of application requesting that LAFCO take proceedings for the annexation of approximately 141 acres known as the Canyon Ranch Annexation currently located in the Sphere of Influence area. So that concludes my quick presentation and I'm available for questions. You, you said, um, maybe I misheard you, but <clears throat> it sounded like you said they had the opportunity to sign up for the services. Uh, were you speaking of sewage and all that and wouldn't they have to sign up to our services or maybe I misunderstood what you said? Uh, you know, I, I, th I think you were correct. That, that's basically what I said because not every, every home has that, the, the, pri the main line in the streets yet. I can tell you, for example, I am aware of one or two properties that are under septic tank, so they probably would likely not go through the process because remember, they would also have to pay for the laterals and for the hookups, but they would have the opportunity to do so if they would like. I think that they would be required to sign up for trash and other services in every building permit or home occupation permit or electrical permit after annexation will be processed through the city. I yeah. do know Public Works and JARP could expand on that. Currently, they are working on a waterline project on Beaumont that potentially might give them the opportunity, should they decide to, hook up to that. Yeah, I thought I was under the understanding, based on something that happened in the past, that any time any land that was in our zone of influence became part of the city, I thought it was then incumbent upon uh, homeowners then to sign up for city services, that they could not continue or, or install septic tanks and things, but maybe I'm wrong. I thought that was something we had in the past. Yeah, so I, I'm gonna ask our public works director slash city manager to answer that, Jarb? Yes, uh, they have an option to. They can hook it up if they wanted to, <clears throat> but we're not, we not mandated that they have to hook up. So right now, the closest sewer line is, is in New Jersey, which is put in by uh, the Korean church. Mm -hmm. So that's where the, the sewer line in from Barton Road to the Korean church. And, and also, uh, by the way, it, it go all the way to uh, the mosque. The mosque, yeah. So, yes, the mosque have sewer. So anybody between there, they can hook it up to the sewer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I do wanna note something that I missed in my presentation is that the, all the larger developments within the 141 acres, such as the mosque, the, career, the church and the wellness facilities, we do have recorded uh, resolutions with them that they are, they are in agreement to this annexation if and when it comes. That is something we established with them upon their approval a long time ago with the county. What about internet, city internet? Uh, th th I can tell you that the applicant is required to do all of that backbone infrastructure, including uh, providing the hookups and wiring for our city fiber optic. That is a requirement for all new development in Loma Linda. So will it extend further? I am not 100% sure, but it, it will to where they're going to be located. Okay, because this is a public hearing, I'm gonna go ahead and open the public hearing and offer an opportunity for anybody wishing to speak on this item to come forward. Seeing nobody running down, we'll close the public hearing and entertain a motion. I move uh, Council Bill R-2022-32. Second. Second. Okay, we have a first and a second. Madam Clerk. Motion is to approve Council Bill R-2022-32, a resolution of application requesting the Local Agency Formation Commission to take proceedings for the annexation of approximately 141 acres known as the Canyon Ranch Annexation. Um, roll call, uh, Councilman Jindal? Yes. Councilman Lennart? Aye. Councilman Rigsby? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Daly? Aye. Mayor Duper? Yes. The item was approved unanimously.
Thank you. Moving on to item number five. Okay. Lorena, yes. You present this one to please. Yes, I'll present this one and the next one as well. So for item number five, the applicant is High Point Groves. They are proposing to subdivide a vacant 12.3 acre site for the future construction of 103 detached residential condominiums, 309 parking spaces, interior private roads, a six foot perimeter block wall, and an open space paseo. There will be three types of architectural styles and three floor plan sizes for a total of nine different home choices. Those styles include Italianate, Prairie, and Craftsman architecture. Those styles are all pre-approved styles within the historic Mission District Ordinance. So to give you an idea of the setting, again, it's a vacant 12.3 acre site and it's west of Bryn Mawr Avenue, west of California Street, south of Park Avenue and north of Citrus Street. It's going to be across from the future park. If you remember about a year or two ago, you guys approved a 15 acre park. It's going to be right across from the 15 acre park. It is, with, it is within the specific plan, the Groves at Loma Linda specific plan, planning area, what we call three five, in the area we call phase three. The designated land use in the specific plan is medium density residential. It allows up to nine dwelling units per acre and a total of up to 103 units for that planning area. The other surrounding uses you're going to see are, is the VA at the top, the Redland Unified School District to the west, directly west, and directly north is the 57 condo project approved two years ago, and directly south is going to be item number three that I'm gonna talk about in Later, later on today. For, that's going to be a future 51 sub, lot subdivision. So previously you were looking at the vicinity map and now we're looking at the land use designation map just to give you an idea once again what's going on and what's happening in this area that we call the groves at Loma Linda specific plan. What's highlighted in the red circle is the project planning area, planning area 35. Again, directly south of it is the is the project that I'm going to discuss um, later on, and that's planning area 35. You see the park, and then you see the other land use designations. Background, so Historical Commission did review this item in September of last year, and they did recommend approval. Some of the requested changes included um, four-sided architectural features, and also they wanted to see colors that pop. And those are usually the recommendations from both historical and planning that staff, staff hears. Last night we had a planning commission hearing and they did recommend approval and they did add two conditions that yesterday, last night, one of the conditions is to make sure that the HOA has assigned guest parking and the other second condition is to work with staff um, in terms of the window placement on some of the side elevations and I'll get to those details later without you seeing a flu floor plan, you don't know what I'm talking about but the second condition was just to like move some of the windows that way when you look out your window, you're not looking at another window and your neighbor in their bedroom. Site plan. So main access to this new planned community um, is going to be through Bryn Mawr and Citrus Avenue. So here is Bryn Mawr adjacent to the park and you can't see my pointer too well but it's the red dot on the screen. So Bryn Mawr and then you come into the site and right here is that open space paseo I was talking about. So we have access through Bryn Mawr and Citrus Avenue. They will be two story detached condos designed in clusters on the bottom left hand of the screen, you'll see what I'm talking about when I'm talking about clusters. Basically, they're, doing, they're sharing a main driveway to get into their new small neighborhood, and they'll each have their individual driveways and a two-car garage. So it will appear as single-family residences with individual yards, but it's going to be at a higher density, which, which the planning area allows, and they're going to be at 8.3 dwelling units per acre. The medium density allows up to nine dwelling units per acre. And there will also be over 100,000 square feet of open space throughout the project site, and that includes the open space paseo. It does comply with the specific plan, and it meets all of the required specific plan setbacks, as well as lot coverage maximums. 
Floor plans, it's gonna be a typical home, anywhere from three to four bedroom options, anywhere for approximately 2,000 square feet to about 2,300 square feet size. You'll see your bedrooms, your walk-in closets, bathrooms, kitchens, dining areas, and as required by our regular municipal code, as well as our specific plan, a two-car garage for single-family type of residences. The three architectural styles, the first one is Craftsman Elevations. Uh, what we see in Craftsman's, which are not anything unique to Craftsman's, it's pretty normal, is concrete tile roofing, gabled roof, exposed rafters and beams, tapered columns, brick base, patterned window panes, and covered front porches. Every design uh, within this planning area, as required by the specific plan, will have three different colors, th minimum three different colors and types of sidings per home. This is the Italianate style. It too includes concrete tile roofing, coin corner siding, arched porched entryway. And within, within this design, all the corner lots will have enhanced elevations for a pleasant street presence. And like I said with the other one, it'll have the required minimum three colors and types of sidings per home. And right here on the right, right hand bottom corner, as you see, the elevation highlighted, or the floor plan highlighted in gray is the elevation you see. So if you see right now, this northern part of the elevation or the top, the elevation is looking into the other elevation. This is where I was trying to describe the window issue that we have. That way, they're making sure this window won't line up with the window across from it. So that was a condition. So we're gonna work with the applicant and make sure he redesigned the elevations that the windows aren't facing each other because they might be only 10 or 15 feet apart. Prairie, uh, what we see with prairie are grids, uh, windows with grids and trimming, wood horizontal siding, square columns. And as, as I don't know if you've noticed, but every elevation that we've seen always has some sort of color that pops. The prairie homes are gonna have red doors. Uh, the previous elevation had blue trimming and shutters, and the one before that had yellow doors that pop. So here we have the color and material board. We do have the physical color and material board right here at the front at any time, if any of you guys wanna walk down here and look at it. I do wanna note that there is going to be unique exterior lighting um, for each elevation and design, and it will be reflective of the time period it's supposed to represent. Landscaping, throughout the development, we're gonna have approximately 300 trees. Um, so we will be in line with our Tree City USA. And we're gonna have 20 different types of trees, including jacaranda, um, some of our favorites like crepe myrtle, Afghan pine. This slide is showing the front yard typical. Remember, well, this is the cluster. The clusters, we see either four, up to four to seven condos in a cluster. Typically, um, on average, most of them are gonna be six at a time. So that's the front yard typical when it comes to landscaping. And on the right hand of side of the screen is going to be the park for sale. I like to call it a pocket park, a, a pocket park with a small picnic area, as well as a tree-lined pathway mimicking a historic orchard. And the nice thing about this is that it also has a DG trail. And just across the street, and you don't see it on this slide, but just across the street is going to be that new 15.9 acre park. So it's gonna tie into the park very nicely. And even as you drive into this new community, you're not gonna see houses right away. You're going to see that open space for sale. Fence wall detail, um, they have designed the fences and wall according to the specific plan requirements. The specific plan requires a split face block wall with uh, a stone veneer pilasters to break up the wall, as well as the in, in, inside the interior areas. What's highlighted in red on the screen on that site plan, those are all the required vinyl walls, and that's gonna be in the interior lots, not visible from the street. What we're gonna be seeing the street is that split face block wall, uh, and the block wall is everything highlighted in green. The signage at the site will be in compliance, again, with both the specific plan and the historical district ordinance. And it will also not only just name the community, but also name that they are in a historical, the Mission Historical District. 
As with all projects, um, the design review committee reviews these projects for compliance and public works did get to review the plans and um, it's, they've agreed that it's been designed according to city specs. FIRE has signed off and approved the access and water plan that is a requirement before we get into entitlement to make sure they could at least make the turns and there's enough water to service um, their needs. My favorite part of the presentation, the renderings. So I'm going to provide two res renderings today. This is the, the first one. It is the entryway into Bryn Mawr. Again, what you see right here at the center of the photo is a driveway, and that's that shared driveway to get into your new cluster neighborhood of the six condos sharing that main driveway, and they go into their individual driveways and their two-car garages. And the second rendering. I don't believe renderings were included in your packet. I am not sure, um, but we can definitely go back to the slide at any time if you'd like to. Environmental review, um, as with all large projects, we do have to go through environmental review as required by CEQA. Fortunately, this project and the next, we already went through the environmental impact report back in 2008 for the entire specific plan area. So this area was reviewed um, and because it is being proposed as we reviewed it back in 2018, there's no additional review necessary at this time. Public noticing was done. Uh, a notice did go out. And I th believe that's a typo. It went out on June 20th. Um, it was posted at three different public locations as well as the project site and the city website. And as the date of this report, the city has not, re has not received any written comments in favor or in opposition of the project. However, several members of the public did come to the Planning Commission last night and staff was able to answer their questions and there were no objections to the project. Findings ha were um, drafted for this project and a long list is listed in your staff report. Some of the most important ones are just making sure that it is consistent with both the specific plan and the city's general plan, which it is, and also conditions have been drafted. Uh, and part of the conditions, the conditions also include the mitigation measures and the mitigation measures were adopted with the environmental Im impact report done through the EIR and those will continue to apply to this project as, as do the standard conditions of approval and the two conditions that Planning Commission placed on the project last night. So to conclude, the developer has made every effort possible to provide the most appropriate design and layout. The project complies with the goals of the general plan and the Groves at Loma Linda specific plan. It is compatible with the existing and future uses in the area. Conditions are in place to ensure appropriate compliance with the mitigations and city standards and findings were provided in support of the current proposal. So staff is asking a lot from you tonight. We are asking that you determine the project exempt you ratify the certificate of appropriateness, which is required because it's within the historical district. You approve the map and you approve the design for the 103 um, detached condominiums and approve the two additional conditions that Planning Commission placed on the project. So that concludes my presentation tonight um, for this specific project. I'm available for questions and the applicant is also available for questions. Thank you. Uh, I'm intrigued by the designation as um, basically condominiums that are detached. Um, is that the means of overcoming the single family resident 7,200 square foot lot minimum or has there been a legislative change that has obviated that requirement of Measure V? Well, it, it's medium density residential, so they aren't R1 7,200 square foot lots. The way that uh, I think it's easier to interpret it or to understand it is it could have been a big apartment building as they're allowed to through the density on that site, but they were trying to create something unique to give the feel of single lot, uh, single lots um, subdivisions at 7,200 square feet as we know they are not. So it, it's a medium density development just designed in a very unique way. Yeah, and I understand that and it's, it's attractive. Uh, 
but it's still single family residences on less than 7,200 square feet if you just, you know, don't get involved in the technical definitions of a condo versus a house. I'm just wondering, does it qualify under the Measure V provisions or has the Measure V requirement been overturned by subsequent legislation? No, it, it's still under the Measure V provisions. The lot itself is um, in, in acres. It's 12.32 acres in size, the lot itself. They aren't creating minimum 7,200 square foot lots. Similar to the high density project just north of it, which is 57 condos, um, the, it, I can I could maybe agree with you that they are creating the appearance of single lot subdivisions, but it is a multi-family lot project. So, and I, maybe the city attorney could expand could, on so, that. So, so what it you know just let's say you were a big proponent of 7,200 square foot lot minimums for single family residences. You would see this as a an up zoning and then a down construction, you know, back down to single family residence. You know, it's R, it's R whatever three, whatever the medium density is. Mm -hmm. And then what you actually built looks like high density R1. Um, and I'm just wondering how it leaps over those requirements when it has done that. And, and I understand what you said, but I just want to make sure that we're not, you know, running afoul of that because some of us got elected on that issue. how it affects Measure V. I, I don't believe we would have designed the specific plan in conflicting with Measure V or the general plan. I agree, but I just wonder how it, mm -hmm. how it achieved so, that. So, the, so this is consistent with the specific plan? I mean, the, the specific plan is consistent with Measure V and, and the general plan, and it allows up to 103 dwelling units on that 12.32 acre site. Um, I, I don't, like I said, I was going to see if the city attorney has anything else to expand on that in terms of Measure V. And I know for single residential single lot subdivisions, it's 7,200 square feet, but this isn't a single lot subdivision like the next presentation I'm going to show. And I, I do know the specific plan also mentions Measure V, so it was definitely the intent of the city and the consultants that worked on it not to conflict with any of our um, overriding documents. Okay, I'm satisfied. Thank you. How was this uh, designated an HOA? Like, what's the decision process for that, to be an HOA or not to be an HOA? Um, historically, because it's condos, we always um, designate HOAs. And we, we do have a condition by Public Works. We conditioned it to be HOA, and we have a list of what we expect in the, the um, recorded covenants, what we expect to be listed on there. And so I know, as I mentioned earlier, Planning Commission wanted an additional uh, item on that document, and that is for to have designated guest parking called out. But it is just a requirement for typically across all jurisdictions with condo projects. Was there a comment about that? Yeah, um, my understanding, and correct if I'm incorrect, a condo is when you buy a condo you kind of own the inside of it, but you don't own the outside. You don't own the yard, it's the HOA that owns the yard. The HOA mm -hmm. owns your roof and your siding on your house. I had those same exact questions, trying to get a better understanding of, of how the condo concept worked, and that is also what I learned. Um, they own all of the common areas, um, including uh, the streets, their private streets, the open paseo. But asking about the what's in the backyard, because they're all going to have their individual backyards fenced off with the vinyl fencing um, from their neighbors, it is my understanding that the actual condo owner will own and have the rights to that property. All right, and then I'm going to nitpick a little. Can we go to a picture with the map? Of course. Site plan or... Uh, that, that one works. Yeah. Landscaping? Okay. 
Major monument and Palastrum monument, what are those? What does it mean? I'm gonna show you what they are. So they're just monument signs. Right here is the, the big one in going into the community. That's the major. And here's the pilaster, the column one. Right now, um, th what you're seeing on there is not the name of the community. That's not been established yet. But if you, you can barely see a, a letter. So whatever the community name is going to be, they're going to put C for the name. And right here, we'll have community. And under that, we'll have historic mission district, rep um, calling out the district that they're located in, acknowledging them. Got it. Right behind the major monument, so that's the only area if I can see these colors correctly that we're using turf grass. What is that area for? I know there's a picnic table, but is that area going to be accessible to the public? Yes, it's a it's an open space paseo. It will be accessible to the public, and it will be maintained by the HOA. Is there a walk path on it? There is a walk path on it, yes. Let me find it for you. Okay, so right here on, on the right-hand side, you'll see a DJ trail. And like I was saying earlier, they're planning to do a row of trees to mimic a historic orchard. And there's also going to be a picnic area, and they'll have the appropriate waste receptacles uh, at the site, too, and where needed. And right here at the bottom is where it says Major Entry Monument. Again, that's signage for the community. So what is that turf area going to be used for? Like, is that... Picnic, hanging out, walking your dogs. There's, there's no specific uh, called out recreational activity. Thank you. You're welcome. Dr. Daly. Yeah, Lorena, we talked this afternoon a little bit and you answered most of my questions. Um, the, uh, one comment and then I'm kind of riding the fence on a question. Um, when the historical committee asked for some colors that pop, we got an effort at that. Um, I'm not real impressed with, with that effort. We're still into grays, browns, and beiges, but uh, at least we're gonna have some doors that look and maybe other things that are different. So that's the comment. Um, I'd still like to see a developer that is bold and has traveled through Europe a little bit to see what bold colors look like. The, the second issue is one that, that I'm a bit perplexed with because it's one that we have experienced in recent years at Loma Linda repeatedly. And that has to do with the number of cars that can be parked. Um, um, these are Condominiums, that'll be what, uh, two to four bedrooms or three to four bedrooms each with a two-car garage. <coughs> we are in a university city in which many times we have relatives that will purchase a condominium or a house and then they basically sublet rooms. And I know we talked about this, but I want to see what other council how other council members feel about it. And then um, we have had, I personally have had, telephone calls from frustrated neighbors that say, you know, I've lived here for 12 years and, and then the house next to me sold, it's four bedroom, but there's about six cars that, that uh, are parked out in front of it. And so my understanding is that there was a condition of approval that basically Help me recall what that <coughs> is because I had yes. questions about just what the intent was and what the okay. outcome could be. Uh, yeah, no, e e excellent comments. So just, just to start on your first comment, yes, the specific plan does clearly indicate that it, we are, it requires earthy neutral, neutral tones in the historic district. Um, so that's why usually it's not proposed colors that pop, but every board, um, historical planning and city council has always requested that, and that's why we were really working hard with the applicant to get something, some sort of color on the design and still in compliance with the uh, specific plan. But once we get out of the specific plan area, that is definitely something that I'm gonna encourage our developers to do. Um, second, second comment, uh, what you said was basically word for word what our planning commissioners said last night in terms of their concerns of the parking issue and 
and students, um, many subdivisions inside the house, let's just call it that, and requiring six to eight parking spaces per condo. Uh, we do know that's a problem. We do have permitted parking throughout the, the city. It is that something we wanna do for this specific site? Not really, because it is a private community with private streets. So what Planning Commission suggested last night, and I have the actual wording on the slide right now, they want us to add a condition of approval that the future homeowners association assign guest parking spaces to include a maximum of number of contiguous days so they can only be there so many days and within so many different allotted hours and of course the hoa will manage and enforce the guest parking regulations so we are going to put it on their recorded documents that they somehow implement this guest parking program in in the planned community so let me, let me admit this so that partially answered one of my questions. Uh, I want to ask Jarb, uh, when we have HOA uh, homeowners associations that are managing houses, condos, or apartments, whatever the case, uh, do the challenges that, that do, do their HOA challenges spill over into the city that we have to help manage? No, I, as a matter of fact, I like homeowner association because they take care of their own, their own issues. So that works as long as they don't have issues. My, my concern is that I don't, how, how many guest parking spaces are we going to have available per, I don't even know what to call Te it. Technically in the development, there's 68 guest, park, guest parking spaces right now as proposed. Planning Commission wants to do something a little d d unique um, to put signage out there. But right now I can tell you on the street and within the development and not looking at the site plan, I believe it was 68. Because so remember, each house itself has four designated parking spaces no matter what, each home. Oh, four. Yes, so they have the two garage and the two on the driveway and maybe a motorcycle, so maybe five up to five vehicles. Okay, so it may be workable. Yeah, so they'll I just at least know this has that. been an issue for us in the past, and that's that's the only reason I raise it. It looks like a nice project. Uh, we've got a little bit of minimum pop in there, so you know maybe we're on a trend here. So I, I like the project. It also helps us meet uh, the priority we had for um, medium density housing mm -hmm. in Area D. So that's good too. So thank you, good job. Thank you. Jeff, no, go ahead and I'll, I'll wrap it up. Yeah, so we do have to open a public uh, hearing on it also. So general comment, um, <clears throat> I would second what Dr. Daly said, right? Like some more pop, something that makes Loma Linda unique. In future projects, if we can keep emphasizing that um, with our developers. Uh, and then second, for me, just nitpicking with this whole turf grass, um, I know I've mentioned it m multiple times, if we could put something that's more appetizing and appealing, because um, this whole area, as you can see, I understand there's a park right in front of it, but something even more local to make it more lively and entertaining for the residents that will eventually live here um, would be preferable. Uh, so I'm not saying that I'm gonna you know, say the, the whole thing is bad, but it could definitely be improved on and I hope that we continue to push that with uh, developers in the future. Thank you. Yes, sir. <coughs> now, I noticed that the Planning Commission said four-sided architecture. Was what was produced yes. satisfactory for that? Because it's, I know there are little, little things that pop out of the bottom, you know, on the craftsman of the, of the windows. Is that it? Because when I look at those other three sides other than the front, they just look like randomly situated windows yes, yes great great question and yes that came that came mostly from historical and planning commission always says it too so here, here's craftsman the one that you just mentioned so previously it did not have windows with the window treatment so we had them add the windows in the windows treatment unfortunately on these elevations you also do not see the exterior lighting as said any exterior lighting will be reflective of the architecture wherever their place is if it's in the rear or the side or the front yard but most of what you're going to see is going to happen with the window treatment in terms of four-sided architecture and even door treatment right here A 
Uh, right just here is a siding, and then you'll see um, iron features and wood shutters, depending on the elevation and the style being proposed. Yeah, just t to me, four-sided architecture means you'd be happy to look at any of the four sides, and they look roughly equivalent. And there's obviously a bias toward the appearance of the front one. So, but if it passed muster with the planning commission, I guess you know that's fine. But you know, it's still not to me true four-sided architecture. One other question: Do we have any idea what these uh, condominiums are going to sell for? Um, I, w I would have to ask the applicant or the builder. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty speculative. Approximately. I mean, I, I know you don't have a definite price yet. Yeah, no, I, I, that's fair enough. High fours, high fours to low high fives. fives. Yeah, I can, I can guess the price. It's going to be as high as the market will bear. There you go. Everybody's okay. got to make it down. Uh, just, a, just a couple of things, and, and this might be putting the cart before the horse a little bit, but um, uh, I do know that the university is uh, in some major planning right now to add quite a significant amount of student housing, which I think is going to change the landscape here because I would, I would guess there would be some type of incentive to keep students on campus. And so I'm, I'm not sure how... Um, how lucrative the uh, the rental business will be, um, and I'm sure it'll still exist, but I, I do think that that's going to change the dynamic a little bit. Uh, you know, so we'll see, and that's coming pretty quickly. And then the second part is, I, I believe there was discussion when we talked about this in our original uh, plan, um, that this was going to be like that kind of young professional housing that was going to feed the the VA facility right there. Wasn't there some thought that this was specifically? Yeah, I'm not sure if this was a um, specific location. I do know right north of it is the 57 condo track. And last I heard in terms of the 57 condo track is those are upward selling almost 700,000. And those are s smaller and is not as uniquely designed as these are. But I, I don't really know housing market too much, but I'm just letting you yeah. know what the I'm, I'm not talking about price. But, yes. I'm talking about the specific clientele. Yes, yeah, so uh, it might have been the 57 condo project or right adjacent to that is going to be a mixed-use development, which usually is intended for the, uh, I would say, a younger professional crowd um, with usually with the commercial on the bottom and residential at the top. That's going to be across from the VA, and it's called Planning Area 3-3, three, three three, and I think that might be the area you're talking about. I'm not 100% sure. Um, it's not clearly described for Planning Area 3-5 yeah. as that in the specific plan. So it might have been a, maybe, a, maybe a personal conversation that I had with the, uh, the director of the VA facility over there, or the director of the VA, I guess the, all the facilities here. I can't think of his name offhand, but he gave us a tour about a year or so ago, and described how hard it was for them to get housing for doctors, nurses, people that are working at the facility, and his hope that as stuff was being built up in the area, that was going to help them out. Um, he even talked about his own personal quest to find a, a home here in town, so um, mm -hmm. he'd be closer for his commute. Anyway, that's just more of a comment. So I'm going to open up the uh, public hearing. Uh, I, I'm not sure if, uh, if Pete, if this was the item you were wait, you're waiting on the next one. Okay. Yeah, if there's anyone that wants to speak on this specific item, please come forward, submit a card to the city clerk. Seeing nobody, I'll close the public comment and entertain a motion, unless we have more questions. I, I, I'm just interested in knowing from the developer, uh, I assume you guys were here last night for the planning commission. Okay, they dropped an additional uh, requirement. Do you see that as uh, reasonable and workable from a developing developer perspective? <coughs> Good evening, Steve Villis with High Point Communities, 530 Technology, Irvine, California. Um, yet we agree with the two additional co uh, conditions that the Planning Commission um, added last night and uh, we're complete agreement with those and all of the other conditions of approval that staff has worked with us on for the last year or so. <laughs> so yes, we are. Good. Yep. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Do you want a motion? Do you want a motion? 
ocean. You pretty, you pretty much got to oh, okay. read up that whole sheet that's yeah. up on this. <laughs> but it was up there. It was a. Uh, If the city attorney has a recommendation for a motion, then I'll support you, but or I'll take a crack at it, whichever. It was just there a second. There it goes. <clears throat> I think I think that's the that's the motion. <clears throat> All right. So how much of that needs to be included in the motion? If if we uh, if if we basically move to ratify. The balance of it. Yes, you can. You can move that recommendation, and then the city clerk will probably go through it a little more. Okay, so vote. moved. Thank you. <laughs> we have a first All right, and a second. So the motion is to one determine the project. The project is exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act, which is CEQA, pursuant to the CEQA guidelines section 15182, which provides an exemption for residential projects located in a specific plan area where a public agency has already prepared an EIR for a specific plan and that residential projects is undertaken pursuant to and in conformity with the specific plan. And to ratify the certificate of appropriateness, certificate of appropriateness for precise plan of design permit number P21-134 and tentative track map permit number P21-133, and approve tentative track map permit number P21-133 to subdivide a 12.32 acre vacant vacant site known as Planning Area 3-5 of the grows at Loma Linda specific plan into four new parcel maps, which is parcel map 20442. And to prove precise plan of design number P21-134 for the proposed architectural styles and design configuration of the 103 detached condominium residential community that will include 309 parking spaces, an open space paseo, interior private walls, and a six-foot perimeter block wall. Um, the project site is located west of Bryn Mawr Avenue and north of Citrus Avenue and is zoned plan community. The planning area is intended for medium density residential and design special planning area D of the general plan within the historic mission overlay district. And it includes the two approved, two additional conditions, which is one, the HOA must assign guest parking spaces, which include the maximum number of contigu contiguous days and hours the spaces can be used. The HOA shall manage and enforce the guest parking regulations. And two, work with staff to revise the window placement of the site elevations of the applicable residents and place the windows in different areas of the site wall so neighbors have more privacy. And this is based on the findings contained in the staff, re staff report and subject to conditions of approval and original mitigation measures adopted on June 12, 2018. That's why she's the city clerk and I'm a mayor <laughs> councilman. Councilman Jindal? Yes. Councilman Lenart? Yes. Councilman Rigsby? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Daly? Aye. Mayor Duper? Yes. The project was approved. Thank you very much. Okay, item number six. It's a long night. You're doing great, thank you very much. Thank you, I'm trying to keep my voice. Okay, item number six, yeah, I did right now. Um, just as a reminder, before I get into item number six, uh, a month ago we came before you, city, city manager presented community <coughs> benefiting improvements and we added, or you added and approved a fifth community benefit um, and that is that includes the preservation of the Frink Adobe as well as the donated lot by the applicant. So this is, the area I'm going to be discussing tonight is that specific area in planning area 3-6. And also another thing, um, as part of my requirement in terms of public hearings that I need to send out a notice of hearing. Uh, the notice of hearing, it requires to have a project description, the project location, and the time and date of the hearing. I usually, usually like to go above and beyond and I include a vicinity map. 
I created a vicinity map and I added the project boundaries and I accidentally did it wrong. So what went out was an incorrect project boundaries. I wanted to get it out there for the, on the record. But what we're going to see is what the developer is proposing, not my artwork. So if anybody comes before you today or ask about that, we are not developing on their lot. That vicinity map was incorrect. But the information and the hearing is all correct. And what you see on the board is what is being pro proposed tonight. So once again, the, high, the applicant is High Point, High Point Groves. They are requesting to subdivide a 22 and a half vacant site with the exception of the Frink Adobe site and create 51 single family residential lots and five lettered lots that will include the historic Frink Ranch property related on and off site improvements and a trail that's adjacent to the historic Zangha channel as well as a six foot perimeter wall. Along with that subdivision request is a request to amend the text found in Chapter 4 of the specific plan, more specifically the development standards and guidelines for planning area 3-6. The request is to change the building to building separation requirement from 40 feet to a 30 feet minimum distance. I would do want to note that this review, this request tonight does not include the architectural elevations or on-site landscaping as the previous project did. This is the map. So High Point is doing the map and at a later time we're going to come before this council with the architectural elevations that Lennar is proposing. The existing setting, um, once again it's in the, the Grove specific plan area. The site itself is mostly vacant at 22 and a half acre in size. It is south of Citrus Avenue south of Brynmore Avenue and north of Mission Road. On the map, it's designated as 3-6. I'm pointing to it with my um, red pointer. It's designated in the specific plan as very low density residential, which requires minimum 10,000 square feet minimum lot sizes. So the image you see now is from the specific plan itself. Earlier we were presenting uh, planning area 3-5. Now we're presenting 22 acres of planning area 3-6. There are a total of 39 acres on it. So I, I need you to understand that a part of this planning area d is not included within the proposed development tonight. Those are private lots that are not part of the proposal. So to give you some background, Historical Commission did review this in December of last year. They did recommend approval and as they usually always do, four-sided architecture and colors that pop. Again, the architectural elevations are not coming before you, but um, something that Historical Commission did approve that I'm excited to show you in the next month or two is a unique architectural elevation that is one that we have not seen yet in this specific plan. So in the next few months when I come with it, um, I am excited to show you that it's not just always going to be craftsmen and Italianate. We're going to come up with, um, for these custom homes, we're going to come with uh, a little bit more than what you're used to. Okay, and so yesterday Planning Commission, they did approve it. And they did add one condition. Um, the previous project, they added two conditions. And for this project, they added one condition. And they are recommending to City Council the condition of approval to add a block wall on the interior property lines of each residential lot instead of the vinyl fencing. So what the map is going to do, it's going to create 51 single family lots. Um, previously it was 52, but since they donated one, it is now 51 single square foot lots that are going to range from 10,000 to approximately 22,000 square feet on size, in size. And that means that this area will have two dwelling units per the acre. Uh, main access will be through Bryn Mawr and Citrus Avenue. Here is Citrus and here is Bryn Mawr. And what you don't see on the slide on the, I guess would be the north side of the the slide, but on the right side of the slide, but the north side of the map is where the future 15.9 acre park is going to be on the corner of Bryn Mawr and Citrus Avenue. So that park will also be across from this new community. There will be four new roads within this project designed according, uh, in accordance to the public works, fire and planning city standards. The future homes on Mission Road as required <coughs> by the specific plan, they will be facing Mission Road 
The Frank Adobe site will be preserved and the applicant did agree, like I said, to donate the lot um, for the future expansion of the agreed upon community benefiting improvement project. The Zangha DG Trail will run along the rear side of the rear side of the homes on Mission Road. And when I show you the landscaping plan, you'll see a better image of the Zangha Trail. So what the applicant will do is propose or install a DG trail above the historic Zangha ditch. And the trails will be part of the lettered lots. We have five lettered lots throughout the, the uh, plant community and most of those lettered lots will go into the landca landscape maintenance district. Letter lot A, will eventually be donated to the Two Canyons Conservancy as you guys learned back in June. In terms of the specific plan amendment, remember they are requesting the current development standards for planning area 36. Every planning area has their unique development standards and in planning area 36, the building to building separation requirement is 40 feet. Our normal 7,200 square feet R1 building to building requirements is 10 feet. So technically um, this custom lot design um, is four times as much as what is, our, is normal to our code. They are asking tonight if we can shrink that down to 30 feet as you see on their design. This is going to be the site plan that's gonna come before you in the next month or two. Uh, and not all of them are going to be 30 feet. They just want that flexibility to place these large homes in a comfortable setting that would still allow emergency access on the side and in the front and then allow for a large backyard with a, with a pool and a little bit more uh, flexibility for the property owner to do what he wants with his property. So you'll see everything from a little 31 feet distance to 45, square, 45 um, linear feet distance. So that is the specific plan amendment. And the reason why it's a specific plan amendment is because the development standards are not in our no, zo normal zoning code. They're in with, within our specific plan folder and document. Landscaping. <coughs> um, what you're seeing here before you is the landscaping for the, ex the exterior portions, not the interior lots, but anything in the street parkway. Within the street parkway, we're gonna see approximately 85 street trees throughout the development including magnolia, fern pine, camphor, California, sycamore, purple leaf plum. Um, the future builder will include trees and plants within the front yard and we will have a front yard typical. And of course he, he will replace and install new trees as needed within the Zangha trail area. So this looks similar to the one from the previous design and that is because it's the same applicant and the same builder that we're going to see. So they use pretty much the, the same um, footprint when it comes into designing. Do keep in mind though, what is being designed and what's in your packets and on the board today, it is in compliance with the specific plan. The specific plan calls out for a split face, um, six foot wall, perimeter wall. Everything in green is the perimeter wall on the screen as well as um, it, it calls for pilasters, um, stone veneer pilasters to just break up the monotony of the wall. And it also calls for vinyl fencing for the interior lots. And one more time, as I said last time, the interior lot vinyl fencing, um, it is not showing. It's not visible for the street. However, last night, Planning Commission did make a condition of approval. Uh, recommending the condition to replace vinyl yard fencing with block wall instead. And also, um, okay, as if, if, uh, just to clarify, so we're all on the same page. Looking at the at the map that we have, everything in green, which would be the exterior wall, is block wall. Yes. Yeah, so what was what is proposed is is vinyl for everything that's red. Yes, yeah, so everything in green exactly is block wall. And as you see too, they have block wall um, within their side yards because then that's where the fencing, the yeah. gate, the vinyl gate would hook up to the house to get into your backyard. Right. And the issue that the planning committee had was? P planning commission, um, wanted them to replace the vinyl fence with block wall. One of our planning commissioners, uh, I wouldn't, I don't know if it's necessarily an issue, but she was concerned that the future owners would, I, I believe, and correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, um, city attorney, but 
that the future owners would want block walls over vinyl walls. Is that correct? I, th I think that's what she, she believes that they'd be um, wanting, if they're gonna be spending a million dollars for homes, that they would prefer block walls over vinyl walls. And that so it was an issue raised by one member of the commission and ultimately the commission voted for that condition. To recommend To recommend us, yes. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so uh, I, I guess to clarify on that too, um, what the applicant is proposing is just in consistent with the specific plan document. And so what the commissioner recommended um, is not necessarily inconsistent, so we don't have to do another specific plan amendment, but it would have to become a condition of approval in order to um, have the developer do that, because that's not, n it's not a normal requirement what, on our specific What's the plan. applicant's position on that? Um, I could have him come now, or we can wait till the end of the presentation. Well, let's just deal with it now, if okay. you wanna deal with it now. I'm assuming market drive, like we just talked a minute ago, market drives your choices here, so. Of course. I, again, Steve Bliss, High Point Communities. Um, we, uh, we would like the council to consider eliminating the condition for side yard between houses in the backyard requirement for block walls. It's um, not consistent with what the market really wants and um, would demand for a product like this. I just want to make sure it's clear that everywhere from the community perspective, as you drive down the streets, as you pull in the driveway, as you're out on Citrus or you come down Bryn Mawr, all you'll see is block walls. So this is only, we're only talking about the rear yards that demise two people's property and then the backyards on all the interior lots, that's all. And it's consistent, as, as Lorena said, it's absolutely consistent with the specific plan. I'm no expert on construction or fencing, but I have learned a few things with experience. There are vinyl walls and there are vinyl fences and then there are vinyl fences. Some that are just kind of driven into the ground and hang there and then there are those that uh, there's trenching done and cement and the vinyl Proper fence is, is anchored to yes. the, the cement. Yes, and, and that's trench. exactly what we're proposing here. And it's a huge here. difference. There's no, no question about that. These are the, uh, among the highest quality of vinyl that you, could, uh, that you can have. So they're not just leaned up and barely stuck yeah. in the ground. They're fully supported and high quality. They're, they will the be the fitting. with a cement anchor that I'm most interested in because we've had to deal with uh, community members that have uh, Loma Linda's kind of skunk USA. <laughs> so we have skunks and raccoons and uh, all dogs and all kinds of other things that dig and they dig under fence, but they can't dig through cement. So we're, are we talking about <coughs> cement foundation for the vinyl? I don't vinyl? believe, do they have a footing? It doesn't go they, all they the way, do, they, just they, being they have, they, have a, they have a cement footing, yes, that they're supported. I just I'm not talking about just the post. No, no, we're, where, where are we? I'm are. talking about it's trenched. But is it just the posts or is it all along the bottom of the fence? Along the bottom, usually there's about maybe a four-inch pillar of the bottom of it. <coughs> so there's a bottom, but uh, that part is fenced because it's, it's uh, If you look at the detail, the cement is only on the, uh, the post. The no, I understand. I understand that. I'm talking about between the posts. I think what council I've seen Bay, both what and I've Bailey experienced both. So... Yeah. It, 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 it's a... Uh, right. Yeah. No, I understand. These are designed... I'm talking about animals that dig. And if the, 
if there's no barrier, they'll dig under it. I'm, I'm telling you, uh, and, and trust me, uh, I've had enough neighbors and even we've experienced it ourselves. So I'm just saying, you know, I'm, I'm only one vote on the council, but, you know, and I don't know who or what the specific reasons were that uh, someone on the planning commission wants all, uh, uh, you know, basically cement bricks in there, but I'm gonna guess that's part of the reason. That wasn't an issue that was brought up. I, not that this makes for a good reason to not so require it, bringing, but it's, it's a reason I'm bringing. It I understand. Up. I understand. Um, one thing that I would like to propose, sort of in the spirit of, of compromise, perhaps, or would be right now, um, if we can go back to this plan. Currently, these side yard gates, if you can see the red dot here, that go to the side yards, there's a gate on each lot that goes. Currently, that's proposed as a vinyl gate, mm -hmm. and that wasn't objected to by the commission last night. We would say that if we could go back to the original condition that is presented here, which again is consistent with the staff report, the original staff report and the specific plan, we would be willing to replace this final gate with a tubular steel, painted tubular steel gate with a privacy mesh behind it. It would be a much nicer appearance from the street. That's what you would see from the street and probably in the long run of higher quality, less prone to sagging and, and just give a nicer appearance to the street. So if we could trade that for that, that would be something we'd be willing to agree to. And, and, and I respect your, your I'm trying to find a solution. I, I, I fully respect your willingness to negotiate on this. Um, we haven't had as much problems with varmints as we used to uh, because coyotes are thriving. <laughs> but we've had big problems in the past. And I'm not talking just from people who've complained to me. I'm talking about in my own yard. And I anything that's put up where there's not a barrier that's underground I don't know how f what the magical footage is, but uh, they'll dig under it. Well, I will tell you from my experience where I live is, um, and I live in a somewhat rural community as well on a large lot, um, possums, raccoons, and skunks are fairly common. Right. They don't dig under, they, they climb up and get on the wall. And if you have a big a block wall that's pretty wide, it gives them a nice area to walk <laughs> along, hop into a tree and get sure. into the yard. I don't have, we've never had a problem with the digging. I'm not saying it doesn't do your happen. Have dogs? It, uh, some of them do. Yeah. yeah. And, but, and, and as soon as the dogs dig a hole, everybody else finds the pathway. <laughs> so I'm just telling I, you. I hear you. I understand. Yeah. What, I understand. What's, what's the, um, is there a different, obviously there's a difference in cost. A significant, uh, significant I can imagine. And yes. then are there, are, are there any, um, uh, expected delays in in construction based on that is it easier it would to get certainly one or take the longer Every, the, 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 there it's a completely different permitting and engineering process to design and engineer and construct and install those block walls in between all the lots <coughs> i will tell you that in the 25 or 30 years that we that high point has been a developer we and we've developed a lot of high quality product we've never been conditioned not saying that's not a good reason to do it now so i'm not i'm just saying for perspective um, we've never been conditioned to build block walls between demising lots or across the back okay have you ever been requested to trench and have cement and within that cement you put the the, the cement is the obviously the foundation for the posts but have and, and but have the cement run up to approximately. No, no we haven't had okay. that. Yeah, <laughs> I'll, I'll give you the names of some competitors that are doing exactly okay, that, very good. and that's why they got uh, some of the. So that sounds like a third do. option because I don't think that they would trench on a block wall either, necessarily. So, a block wall is a block wall. Yeah, but there has to be. Some, yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, then, if you're going to do one, it's about the same as the other in terms of cost, I would imagine. I, I, I don't think so. A block wall with a foundation costs more than a vinyl fence on the same basic cement foundation. 
Well, the foundation purpose of the foundation for the block wall is to support the weight sure. of the sure. wall. So the vinyl fences, of course, are much lighter. And so there's not a structural or an engineering need for a footing is what you're really referring to is for a footing from a structural or engineering perspective. Yeah. Hey, okay. block, block, block walls are wonderful and they're pretty, but I also understand they're expensive and I think that mm -hmm. may be overkill in terms of our requirement. Thank you. But I, I, uh, um, I disagree with you regarding the efficacy of, of having a cement foundation uh, uh, as an anchor, but then in between the posts uh, on, on a uh, vinyl fence. Okay. And if you want to see what I'm talking about, I've got people to send you to. Okay. Well, could we perhaps agree to work with staff to come up with a solution that would um, deter? Because even a cement footing wouldn't necessarily yeah, deter I mean, digging, I but mean, something to something deter. To put wire meshes in and right. That something, stuff too. some something that would <laughs> would be um, reasonable to deter that type of digging activity. I guess. Let's hear the rest of the proposal. Okay, very good. And I'm available for any other questions. So I got a question off fencing. Oh, for me. Sure. Okay. Um, for anyone. So 30 years down the road, when this vinyl fencing um, needs to be replaced, one of the neighbors says, hey, I don't want to pay to replace the fencing. What happens then? I can tell you that. The one who wants it more pays more. Generally speaking, that's the case. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, would that happen with the brick wall, too? Or does the brick wall, like, I'm assuming it has a longer lifespan than a vinyl fence. It would, yes, it definitely would have a longer lifespan than a vinyl fence. But you know, as people design their backyards, these are going to be higher end homes with, with larger backyards and probably, a, you know, pools and outdoor kitchens and those types of things. Um, the people that are building those would want to design some type of wall, perhaps not necessarily what we would install that would be consistent with what their, the theme of their backyard is rather than even having this wall imposed on them of this particular color, this particular style that's all predetermined for them might not be consistent with what they want. So in a sense, this will give the, the, the homeowners uh, more options down the road. I, I, okay. agree, with, I agree with that statement. Yeah. All right, oftentimes, thank you. Oftentimes, oftentimes the pool builders want to take the wall down y to get their get equipment their back. Cap cap that cap always happens. That's, that's, right. <laughs> that's, that's a huge one right there. Right. And, and, the, and so from installing my own pool, and telling you that that vinyl fencing comes down far easier than a than a block wall does for the purpose of getting a dozer and all kinds of stuff back there. Yep. Um, you're just talking about an incredible amount of, of, of work. Good. That, Very good. I, 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 I would say I do like that idea of the tubular fencing from the street. Yeah, that's the not view a, from that's the, not a yeah. View. We, as because I said, I, I drive into communities and I see vinyl fencing there, and it's like it's a vinyl uh, gate actually. If you want to look out your backyard and see vinyl fencing, if you don't like it, replace it. Right, but. In the community, you're driving around. It would be nice to see something you suggested. I, again, yes. A little more elegant. So if front. we could go back to this design, that would be something that would be, uh, we think, a, a, a good so compromise solution and actually enhance the community. Something to consider. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I agree. So I also want to note then, um, when we come before with the architectural plans, we will be showing the fall, wins, fall fence wall and monument detail once again. So depending what's decided tonight, um, it will be reflected on the updated plan with Lennar. But to, tonight it's a high point in the map. Okay, as with all projects, like the previous one, we go through a design review committee, um, public work, fire, all signed off on it and reviewed it, and it has been designed according to all city specs and department specs. Same type of environmental review, the entire specific plan uh, did go through an environmental impact re review process, and it was certified in 2018, and what's being designed and proposed today um, is not is consistent with what was reviewed and analyzed back in 2018, and so no further CEQA review is required. Public noticing went out on June 20th, and it was 
posted at three public locations, including the project site and on the city website. We did receive a written comment in favor of this project. It came from Two Canyons Conservancy, Mr. Pete Dangerman, and he also quickly touched up on his approval and support of the, not only the project, but of the community benefiting improvements, and that has been um, uh, included or provided to you today on the dais. Um, that was the only written comment we received, but however, we did receive multiple people, uh, multiple comments last night at the Planning Commission, and staff did clarify concerns and answered their questions. And I do have to admit, most of their concerns were regarding my um, vicinity map that I addressed earlier in this presentation. That was just a mistake on staff's part. Findings were included in the packet, they're in your staff report, and it, like I said before, it is consistent with both the specific plan and the general plan. Conditions of approval are part of the project and the mitigation measures will continue to apply for this project. So to conclude, the developer has made every effort possible to provide the most appropriate design and layout for planning area 3-6. It complies with the goals of the general plan and the specific plan. It is compatible with the existing and future uses in the area. Conditions are in place to ensure appropriate compliance with mitigation and city standards, and findings were provided in support of the current proposal. So staff is recommending that you're determining this MAP project exempt, that you approve the resolution to approve the specific plan amendment from 40 to 30 feet minimum distance, that you ratify the certificate of appropriateness for the MAP, and it's required because it's in the historical district, and that you approve the map to subdivide the 22.5 acre vacant site um, in planning area 36 with, and to create 51 single family residential lots and five lettered lots. And that includes the preservation of the historic Frank Ranch property and related on offsite improvements along with the DG trail following the historic Zangha ditch. Um, and also as part of the recommendation tonight is planning conditions added condition to install block wall on the interior property lines of each residential lot instead of vinyl fencing. So that concludes my presentation. I am available for questions and as you know, the applicant is here too. I have one, one question for you. <clears throat> as far as staff goes, do you, do you uh, follow with the planning commission? Do you agree with that recommendation? for that approval, that a condition of approval? I, I th as far as staff goes, I, I believe it's a little strict. Um, staff is usually in the business of compliance with the code. I'm following the adopted regulations and plans that, that you guys have uh, helped create and adopt. So um, well, I would have to say that it, it's a little bit more than what the plan is requiring, so I wouldn't necessarily agree. Uh, it could be a great benefit to the future property owners, but then again, if I was a buyer and if I can save $40,000 um, on a million dollar home, I probably would like to. So I wanna assume that it would increase the future home prices. So if I got to pick, I, I, would, I would rather spend less money on my future home. But again, as, as staff goes, um, my job is to enforce the regulations created by the residents and, and this council. And that is exactly what we did, and not just planning, but all the other departments. So following the, the specific plan and the municipal code and all the other city specs, that is what they're doing. And so that I am just showing you the facts and showing you that they comply with the adopted uh, plans that we bring forward to you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> do you need to open? Dr. Do you need to open the? I I do. I was waiting for questions from the dais first, and then we'll open the public comment. We can ask questions before opening. Yeah, absolutely. I got a few. Do you? All right. Um, so I need some clarification on what we're voting on. We just spent about half an hour talking about fencing, but if I'm reading the tentative track map permit, if I, from my understanding, we're just approving. Like how everything's gonna look like. Yeah. So where does the fencing and you mentioned landscaping come in? Like which part does that fall under? Um, it's a part of the track map. And one of the requirements for the track maps when they submit is to also submit preliminary grading and preliminary landscaping. And the lands preliminary landscaping, you're required to indicate all proposed future 
exterior and perim perimeter walls. And so th that's why it's shown on, on today's presentation. Now, when we come back again with the architectural elevations, we're gonna bring the revised plans if we decide to revise them today, which in one way of one form or another, I assume they're gonna be revised um, per the wall uh, condition. But what we're approving tonight is pretty much, I'd like to say, just the specific plan amendment and the tentative track map. The tentative track map includes the details of the walls and, uh, and as part of that, that submittal, uh, we also require a preliminary landscape plan. That's going to be almost the same preliminary landscape plan that comes before you in the next month or so, but the one that comes before you in the next month or so will also have front yard typicals. Okay, so just to confirm, this is preliminary, so it can com have a completely different face when it comes back a month from now. Um, it should not be completely different, no. It should be in line with what you're seeing now. Just as when, when you approve something, um, for example, Lennar next door, what we bring before you for entitlement is always the preliminary landscape plan. It's not, not until they go into the plan check process, which is the next, state, the next step. So what we're doing tonight is the entitlement, which is land use approval. You are approving that they use this land for 51 lots. Next, they'll submit to plan check, and at plan check, it will be the final landscaping plans. And my job is to make sure it's in substantial conformance with the preliminary plans that you approve. Sometimes it's not 100% the same, and sometimes staff, once they get into plan check, says that we can no longer have that tree because there is some sort of disease or virus going out there and changes along the way. But I will always ensure that it is at least in substantial conformance. Can we go back to the landscape uh, slide? Okay, compared to the Lennar homes that we currently have, how does this landscaping compare? It, not looking at Lenar Homes, I'm not quite sure, but I do want to note then that what we're seeing here is the parkway trees. Um, it's not necessarily, right now you're seeing 85 trees, for example. When we come back with the front yard typicals, every front yard, no matter what our landscaping regulation says, you need a, a minimum two trees per, per home. Right now they're, many, they're, meeting, they're above the minimum at 85 trees. All they need is 51 to be in compliance. But they're not going to just have 85. They're also going to have front yard trees, one to two to three. Uh, one to three trees? Or do you remember? Um, I, generally it would be one, but it can really, based on what we're approved, it depends on other utilities going there, driveways, and all that. But yeah. Yeah. So then standard for his design, like he was saying, in the front yard is one. Loma Linda, um, our requirement is two trees, and the two trees could either be in the street parkway or within the front yard. However, they can meet that minimum. So no matter what, they are going to go above, uh, above and beyond the minimum requirements. Okay. And it's my understanding, too, um, uh, and to finish your question, when they get to plan check and JARV reviews it, um, it that's staff and public works always make sure that it's consistent with the adjacent residential developments as well. Um, I'm not too familiar with trees and nor am I an expert, but we have a, a large public works staff that makes sure that it has the correct irrigation and that the trees aren't going to um, destroy the sidewalks in the near future. And they, they, from my understanding, try to be consistent block after block um, to keep that theme going throughout the community. I'm understanding correctly, this is not an HOA, correct? That is correct. Great. Okay, um, so just landscaping next time, like for right now, it looks fine. Uh, if we can get a little more detail and we can um, sync uh, outside of the meeting as well. Um, just what I'm personally looking for is if we're having this Frank Adobe slash Zanja site, uh, we wanna make sure that we are enhancing everything around it as well, right? So that whole neighborhood should um, reflect that, whether that be historically slash environmentally. Um, so just like I said with the last one, right, um, the more inviting we can make it, the better. Um, so I hope that we can get a little more detail with the I think that's a great I idea. I, I will ask the applicant when we come before you with the architectural um, portion of it with a more beefed up, enhanced preliminary landscaping. And I do want to know in terms of the Frink Adobe site, as I said, it, it's going to go into the hands of the Two Canyons Conservancy. So we're relying on them to design their new museum park area consistent with what's around them too. And I, I think they are on board and they definitely want to keep the same feel in the area. It's the same comment for them as well, right? Uh, the more focus we have on environment and 
the more beautiful we can make that area look, the better. So uh, would love to have their collaboration. Um, next question, how many points of entrances and exits do we have for vehicles? Two. So that's so the Bryn Mawr Avenue. Here, here's street. Citrus and Bryn Mawr, and these two new streets, one here is right now it's called A Street and C Street. Okay, so A Street goes off the map to the right. Uh, it goes off into the 103 condo unit project. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. So you can't see it here, but um, A Street, if it was to keep going straight, it goes into the condo, the 103 condominium project that you guys just approved. Bryn Mawr right here, that's going to be a larger street, uh, and that's going to be going... Um, North to south and west of it will be the 103 condos and east of it will be the new park. Do we have bike trails on Mission Road right now? Say it no. again. Bike trails? On Mission? No. I, no. Okay. Right now there's no bike trail on, on bike lane on, on Mission Road. In regards to traffic with, <coughs> again, this development and the one we previously talked about, Mission Road is really narrow. Um, are we forcing traffic to get worse there, uh, whether it be school bus pickups or just regular traffic with the stop signs? That would affect it's, current it's, residents? It's not related to this project, but Mission Road's no, going to be pulled aside. I, I can answer that. I can, I can answer that, the mayor, because we went through this as part of a specific plan. We have a number of workshops and, and, and uh, meetings and meeting after, you know, for, for this specific plan. And one of the reasons we're not connecting Bryn Mawr to, to Mission Road is for that exact reason. We don't want the traffic to connect to, to Mission Road to be able to cut through uh, a subdivision to go to Redlands Boulevard. So that's one of the reasons why we, we don't connect those roads. <coughs> so I think and I was also, <coughs> we're gonna cul de sac off the Mission Road at the, at the east end, uh, and then we're gonna put the traffic signal at, at California and uh, and Orange Street so to, to uh, reduce the speed and, and uh, on, on Mission Road. That was the whole reason. It's, it's part of the traffic circulation plan for the whole specific plan. <coughs> and I want to add one more thing. <coughs> I'm running out of voice already. This, this 51 lot, you have to give the credit to Councilman Rigsby because we have been working very hard to get the last lot in this specific plan so we can have a million dollar home subdivision in, in the city of Loma Linda. And this will be the first one in Loma Linda. Okay. Take a bow. Following up on that question, um, so those lots 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, and 19, their entrance would be for Mission Road. That's right? correct. It's so required per the specific plan. Those ones specifically, would they hold up traffic when we have cars turning into them? Can you repeat that? Would they um, hold up traffic the, when we have uh, cars turning into I, those I do lots? want to remind you, we, we did do a traffic study through the EIR, um, not knowing the details, but I, I'm sure that that was addressed. No, I, I, I can answer that question. Is The answer is no. When they turn, all, all the... All the single family home on Mission Road right now all have driveway to, to Mission Road. And, and so no, it's just a short time frame where people pull in and out of, of, uh, of the, uh, the lot. Now, this one is even better because it's a wider lot. Uh, I think there's two driveway, I don't have to find each one. So the answer is no, it's not gonna hold up the traffic. I, I think we got the answer from you can save your voice <laughs> jar yes yes yeah, just, just a drive one driveway so <clears throat> and and the mayor you have the house facing mission road too so you can see your neighbor that i don't think they have a traffic backing up from backing in and out of the uh, yeah. that those, those subdivision Okay, save your voice. We're good. <laughs> okay. All right, last question from my end. Those houses, again, 14 through 19, um, we talked about fencing for a long time. 
Is there anything that reduces or anything that we're implementing that would reduce the noise going into the house from Mission Road? So, so I just I got to I got to jump in here because what it, what I think you might have missed is that Mission Road is going to be cul de sac off. That has nothing to do with this project. So at, at a certain point, there's going to be very little traffic on the Mission Road. So I, I don't I don't know that that's really going to impact either way in terms of traffic flow or noise, because the the goal of what's happening right now because I live there is it's a raceway up and down and it's people who cut from Redlands to cut through to get to our off ramps and on ramps. Um, outs, if this project wasn't even in existence, there's been a long term plan to cul-de-sac Mission Road off. And so that's gonna essentially stop probably about 80% of the traffic that flows through there. So um, I think, it, I, I just don't think that's gonna be, be an issue. But there's there's still a connection from Orange on to Mission. <clears throat> there is, but you it's have a to couple of sharp turns and through residential. Yeah, it's it's not and that would dissuade the Redlands people. It, well, and it dissuades the racers too. Yeah, yeah, it's not impossible to get through there. It's just people from Redlands are so used to stop signs they don't know about racing. Okay, any other questions? I, I still have to open up the public comment. <coughs> Excuse me. J just a couple of, of comments. Uh, I, I mean, I'm voting in support of the track map. That's all we're working on tonight. And, and that's fine. But I just want to make a couple of other comments. Uh, there's been several references made to million dollar homes. I don't know how accurate that is, but uh, it's kind of the state of real estate, I guess. Um, so, uh, uh, three different quick comments. One is, um, I happen to live in a single story, 3,000 something square foot house. We have frequent, and, and it, it, there's an ebb and flow to it, but constant offers of people wanting to move in, typically retirees, who want to be near the VA or near the medical center in sunny Southern California, but they don't want two story. So uh, we're not planning any, or not planning, we're not approving anything related to the houses you're planning to put in there. If you have not already, I would urge you to look at some single story. What's that? Oh, yeah, go for it. <coughs> Steve Bliss, High Point Communities. Um, yeah, uh, fully a third of the homes in this subdivision are proposed as single story. Uh, a little bit louder. I've said uh, fully a third, one third oh, of really? the homes okay. in this community Fantastic. will be proposed as single story. Fantastic. Yeah, I think Good. it's like, what, 18 or something like that? 17. 17. Good 17 job. single story Good houses. Good job, okay. because Thanks. everybody wants to build vertical Agreed. right yep. now. And, and I understand the economics of all of that, but, but good job, and I, I certainly hope and believe that's going to be worth the investment you're making in this, just based on the harassment that uh, we and a few of our neighbors get, uh, people coming sure. in and, I mean, making ridiculous offers just to buy our house, not because it's so wonderful, but it's a single story in Loma Linda near two medical centers. Sure, absolutely. When just, you know, this is just going to be a great place to live within Loma Linda because of all of the uh, uh, amenities that the Groves yeah. is providing. The $13.8 million of community benefiting improvements are coming along with these two projects, which is the community center, the fire station, the 13 plus acre park, the Oak Woodland Preserve, the preservation of the Frank Adobe, and in addition to the Citrus Trails Park, which is next door. So this is gonna be just a, a, a very, very lovely area when it's completed. Good job. Right, Hopefully you. we're on a roll. Let me point out two other things. For two me. other recommendations for you. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Um, our house has double door entry. Mm -hmm. I have multiple friends who purchased homes that are nice homes, single or double store, uh, uh, two stories, who have single entry and if you teach piano lessons, you got a problem. And if you do other things, you got a problem. And they get pool tables and so forth. 
at least give it some consideration because uh, it's been, it's, it's really been, uh, we didn't buy the house because it had a double door entry, but boy, we've sure taken advantage of it. So that's- I agree, and duly I noted. Know, I have yes. no idea what the economics on that are, but just to throw Thank it you. out there. Okay. And then the final thing, if we're talking about a upscale neighborhood, one of the issues that we have had in Loma Linda, and I know there are surrounding areas that have had the same issue, and that is uh, postal uh, regulations currently require uh, that you have kind of a community. The gang, mailbox, the mailbox is a common, or right. yes. What's that? The common mailboxes in the right, gangs, right, 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 correct. Right, yeah, which that's up to the post office. But if this is an upscale neighborhood, um, uh, we have had we had three different incidents in our neighborhood within about a year, maybe a little more, where people go into the back and break them open and start stealing mail. Well, what that means is that now everybody in that neighborhood has to go to the post office to pick up their mail. Well, not a huge deal, except the post office says they will replace that within six months and don't plan on it being much sooner. No. And so after the third time, you know, we've, I live in a nice neighborhood there, everybody gets along, we pass the hat and the post office said if we would buy the secure mailboxes and uh, have them installed, they would key them for us and we could go basically move to the front of the line. If I'm buying a million dollar house from you, uh, it would seem to be, uh, I mean, it, it wasn't hugely expensive at all, but to get secure mailboxes versus kind of the sure. Rin Tin Tin ones that they put in routinely. And I think that for some people would potentially be a selling point. Very good. Well, that's noted, it. Then we'll so check into that for sure. Yeah, yeah that's, thank you. Uh, so we, I think we agree on everything but the fence right now. Okay. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. In, thank you. Yes, the, the, ori the original plan for this community was custom, custom homes. That's what we wanted. But it didn't come out because, you know, couldn't interest anybody in even buying the property uh, because they'd have no control and no profits. Uh, is it currently <coughs> planned to be semi custom or is it all just like a regular tract with just higher amenity homes and things? It will be built as a higher end production um, type of project. It won't be custom lots sold off individually where someone can pick a house and build on a lot. That's just extremely time consuming and to absorb this number of lots in a basis like that, it would just take way too long to do. So um, it will be a high end residential single family, but high, it'll be production. But Lennar is going to build it in there in my opinion, the premier builder in not only Southern California, but across the nation, and they know how to build a high quality product. Even the product that they put at Citrus Trails next door, I think is, is a very high quality, and that, and that sells for less money than these will sell for. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna open the, open the public hearing, and I know we at least have uh, two speakers that wanna speak on this issue. Mr. Dangerman? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And my address is 1711 Rolling Hills Road in Sacramento. It's uh, three, three blocks long and dead flat. But anyway, it's called Rolling Hills. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, again, I just wanted to briefly say uh, thank you uh, to you and, and to uh, Steve and his staff that, uh, for what you accomplished uh, uh, last week. It's really meant a lot to us. And um, today our uh, Two Canyons Conservancy Board uh, met and they uh, unanimously approved of the acceptance of, of this area and uh, uh, wanted to move forward. Uh, second part of it was that they formed a special uh, committee to uh, work on this that'll be both members as well as other people that are of interest uh, that are interested in it, the Daughters of American Republican, they 
the DAR and the, and the local historical society that there are other people that want to be a part of that. But one of the things we're thinking about too and, and you were discussing this evening and that is how to make it a very special part of the local community. And what we're th wanting to do uh, is to have maybe a workshop in the local community that where we could get people together and get their opinions and, and uh, inputs so that they would feel like it's part of their community uh, and that, that's our desire and to make it as, as handsome as possible and uh, fitting with both of the neighborhood as well as the original historic uh, feeling of it as well. So at any rate, those are the basic pieces of news, but thank you very much. Uh, oh, and I should say another fence design is my backyard, which is a green wall fence. It's all covered with ivy, but anyway. <laughs> and thank you for your letter. We got that also uh, and uh, you talked about, yeah. yeah. Uh, that was uh, we good. really appreciated it very, very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Well, we, we, uh, you've got a partner now here with the city, so we expect to see you here quite often. Yeah, okay. Even <laughs> though you live just a little bit of ways. Yeah, yeah. By the way, we started a special fund already to uh, raising funds and, and uh, building yeah. on what the supervisor, supervisor yeah. donated, and, and uh, we feel like we're off and running. We, what we'd like to do is to get enough money to deal with the site work at the same time as Lennar is working on there so we could bring a contractor over and uh, at a lesser price and get going. So we're running as fast as we can. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Robert Newman. Yes. <clears throat> Good evening. My name is Robert Newman. I live in Grand Terrace on Preston Street, 12009 Preston Street. I did get a little confused um, by the item. There's a structure that currently exists near this particular project. There is a barn structure that sits kind of back uh, north of Mission Road, and um, I assume that it's part of this project. Um, I know that it's basically west of the adobe and just behind those structures. I wanted to express my interest in removing that building and basically recycling it rather than <coughs> having it demoed and, and bulldozed and just basically demolished and then uh, hauled away as basically garbage. I'm not, uh, is, that, what, is that private property or is that part of this? It, it is part of it. Uh, you can talk to High Point, so. Okay, sounds like maybe you can work out something with, with the owners back there and Okay. So I'll add to that. Um, we did require that the developer um, create a report or a study and provide to us about the st structural integrity or if it's worth saving, and the report said it was not, so staff was okay and would issue a, de a demolition permit. So as uh, Jarb just indicated, we would be in support of him working directly with the applicant in doing what he needs to do to take take away that structure or demolish it as needed because as of right now there's no structural or historical integrity for that structure. Uh, it, this sounds like one of those things that we probably do, shouldn't be in the middle of uh, as far as the city uh, considering it's owned by the developer. Um, I would say this though and I'm not 100% certain but um, it may or may not be being used by transients and for other purposes so the sooner that building can come down, since it holds no historical value, probably better for the community either way. So whatever you got to work out over there, you guys can work it out. The only thing I can add to what you were saying was um, a number of buildings, when, they're, when they reside vacant, uh, transients do move in and then decide to uh, make a fire to keep themselves warm, and then it creates issues, and the building gets engulfed in flames, yeah. and then becomes a different kind of, whole different kind of issue rather than getting it removed basically. Yeah, it, again, it's really not, it's outside of our purview, but if the city manager can help in any way, um, you can work with the developer and see what, what can be done. Thank pardon, you. Pardon me if I can address that issue too, and we've, we've talked briefly with uh, Steve about the idea of maybe salvaging some of the material that might be useful for what we're doing, either there or someplace else in the canyon. So uh, we got, no. We're <laughs> first dibs, but 
uh, we'd be glad to maybe work together on that. So. Yeah, I, I think from a city standpoint, uh, it, just the expediency of yeah. removing another rent-free housing location. Okay, uh, anyone else who'd like to speak on this topic before we close the public comment? Seeing no one, we're going to close the public comment. Anything further from the dais? Uh, I see that Dr. Rigsby might have a... I would just like to move the staff recommendation and removing the additional condition of the block walls and Second. accepting the offer of uh, alternate gates. I, I didn't hear the second part. You, you said accepting or not accepting? Accepting the offer of gate uh, swap out, but removing so, the requirement for the block walls. And uh, we had a second that was in favor of that. So wait, wait I, I'm not. Sh is it second? Is there a second one? Yes. Okay. Do you have another question we can Well, yeah, address? so if not a block wall, then a vinyl wall? Yes. Or That's what the original proposal was. Yeah. yeah, but you're not talking about foundation? Of no, a wall. Co no comment on foundation, because I think a foundation on a vinyl wall just sounds kind of odd. And I, I, think your <laughs> idea, I think your idea is a good one, but it's just kind of an odd way to do it. But well, it happens a lot. Yeah. So since we're in discussion, question about that. Um, is there any viability in doing the green wall? Because I actually like that idea. Like, does that address everyone's concerns? And is that something that could happen? No. On a, on a note with that, with vines, um, it's up to the, the property, property owner, owner to landscape his backyard. So he would definitely have the option to do a green wall and vines up on, whether it's a block wall or vinyl fencing. Do we need clarification on the compromise offer? I forget exactly how you described that. A gate uh, consisting of? It would be a metal gate with a sort of a mesh privacy component behind it. You know, you see those with the little holes. If you get close enough to it, you can see through, but it, it's fairly opaque from the street, so you can't see into the side yards. But um, that's what it would be. It'd be a painted steel, tubular steel or square steel gate permanently mounted to the side block walls. So your motion would be for them to, for the city, direct the city to negotiate with the developer over the, that gate, yeah. Oh, one quick thing about the, that 10 foot change, that was not changing any lot size, right? That was just like sliding a house, one way there, okay. Yeah, I agree with the reduction in the uh, building separations because you don't want you don't want uh, New Orleans style shotgun houses on these narrow lots. <laughs> Any further questions? Okay, Madam Clerk. The motion is to determine that the project is exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act (CEQA) to approve Council Bill R-2022-08, a resolution to approve specific plan amendment number P-21-179 to amend the text found in Chapter 4, 4.4.2 of the Groves of Loma Linda specific plan, more specifically the development standards and guidelines table for planning area 3-6, very low residential. The request is to change the building to building separation requirement from 40 feet to 30 feet minimum distance. And to ratify the certificate appropriateness for tentative track map permit number P21-087. To approve tentative track map permit number P21-087 to subdivide a 22.58 acre vacant site within planning area 3-6 of the Groves of Loma Linda specific plan and create 51 estate style residential lots, map 20417, ranging from 10,000 square feet to a half acre or larger in size, and five leather, lettered lots that will preserve the historic Frank Adobe Ranch property, related on and off site improvements, and a trail adjacent to the historic Zanhal Channel, 
Uh, there will be also a six foot perimeter block wall and vinyl fencing on the site and rear property lines of each residential lot. The project site is generally located in, on the south side of Citrus Ave Avenue and south side of Citrus Avenue and Bryn Mawr Avenue and designated as Special Planning Area D within the historic Mission Overlay District Zone Plan Community and intended for very low density residential. And to remove or not to include the additional condition of, of installing the, black, the block wall on the interior property lines and to accept the alternate of installing a metal gate with mesh privacy on the side, the front side of the properties. Councilman Jindal? Yes. Councilman Lenart? Yes. Councilman Rigsby? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Daly? No. Mayor Duper? Yes. The motion was approved unanimously. Thank you. No, oh, I'm sorry, no. I didn't. You voted no. I'm I sorry. voted Excuse no. Excuse me. Yes. So the, the, the yeah. <laughs> I don't like varmints the crawling under the fence. <laughs> I apologize. The, this so guy's the, got a gopher problem, so I really don't understand that. But anyway. <laughs> the project I've was approved by a vote of four A's and one no. Do you have any ideas for stopping puncture vine seeds from... Okay, thank you very much. Good luck with your project. And we'll see you here in a few weeks. Uh, I know we also have some people waiting to speak on item 15, so we'll move item 15 up next. Um, there's not much to do as far as a presentation, uh, and the city attorney may want to want to speak on it, which is our resolution for the intent to transition. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just briefly, the city did receive a demand letter from the law firm of Schinkman and Hughes um, asking that the city transition from its at-large elections to district elections pursuant to the California Voter Rights Act. And um, although the city doesn't believe that any voters, uh, the vote of any voter has been compromised by the at-large system, and we deny that our at-large voting system does violate the CVRA, that's the California Voting Rights Act, um, based on what has happened in other cities and the, the fact that um, no city has prevailed in an action involving uh, a claim that they should move to um, district elections. The city has determined that the best course of action, our staff has recommended that the best course of action is that the city voluntarily move in that direction. If the city voluntarily moves in that direction and um, complies with the requirements of the CVRA to transition during a specific time as set forth in the government or the elections code, then uh, attorney's fees for the um, the potential plaintiffs who are demanding the transition are capped at the sum of 30000 Also because in order to defend that type of litigation, even if a city were to prevail, would cost, well, I think in my report I said hundreds of thousands, but actually millions of dollars to defend. Um, city staff has recommended that uh, the city voluntarily transition. So what you have <clears throat> before you is a resolution of intention um, stating those things, also providing as part of the, the compliance, the city is required to hold public hearings, two public hearings uh, to inform the electorate on what is involved in the process and then some time to allow the residents to submit drafts of maps and suggestions of w how the district should be formed, and then two public hearings in regard to that. So we have <coughs> indicated, excuse me, in the, um, in the staff report that the tentative hearings would be August 9, September 6, October 11 and October 25. Now, those dates 
are based upon the ability of the city to get an extension from the plaintiff's counsel to give us some additional time. Um, we believe that that will be agreed upon. Um, if for some reason <clears throat> it isn't, then we will have to revise those dates. But at this point, it looks like those dates should be good, so. Okay. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Um, we do have a couple of speakers from the public. Um, Can I ask two questions before? Yeah, yes. Okay. <clears throat> so I know I asked quite a few during the closed session. Um, two more that came up to mind. If, let, let's say we all agreed to go um, towards that Palm Desert route, um, is there a cost to us if we wanted to put it on the ballot to revise the charter? A cost? Yes. 15000 <sighs> Okay, There's and would we some be? Costs. I'm not sure exactly what the number. Would is. we be able to put it on the ballot for this November, or is it too late? I think it would be too late. Yes. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we had two uh, comment cards. Uh, Phil Courtney. If you could step outside, I'm wondering. Okay, you want to grab grab him first, or who? James, you're uh, James Albert? Yes. Okay. You can come on down and we'll, I guess we'll get him when he comes in. Okay. I'm back. <clears throat> Hello, uh, Mayor and Council and staff. Uh, my name is James Albert. Uh, I live in the city of San Bernardino, but I'm an avid attendee of the Drayson Center. I uh, regularly play basketball there on Sunday mornings, so I feel a close kinship with, with Loma Linda. Um, I'm speaking uh, in regards to this item. Uh, I do want to actually clarify for the record. Uh, it's my understanding that the deadline for getting uh, measures to the ballot in November uh, is in early August, actually, and this is verified from the county elections uh, department, which I'm, is my understanding that you contract with uh, to run your local elections. Um, uh, as mentioned, there, there is precedent um, for with the, with the city of uh, Palm Desert that reached a settlement uh, in regards to the CVRA uh, that I hope that you look at. As a chartered city in California, you do have the authority to look at alternative methods of voting, like ranked choice voting that I provided you there with, um, as an acceptable uh, modification under the, under the CVRA. And I really do hope that you take a look at it, um, because I do share your skepticism uh, in terms of going from at large to what I would imagine is five single seat winner take all districts in a city the size of Loma Linda. I, I do have some concerns that that is the, I, I don't think that that is the best pathway to fair representation for all uh, in Loma Linda. Uh, but I do think that the combination of ranked choice voting with also the, the consideration of moving um, from your, when you have a, have a council, when you have your elections, you decide those elections in the primary rather than the general. And the general happens to be where the largest amount of folks come out and vote. And I think that the combinations of those two uh, reforms will, will help bridge uh, the representation gap uh, in the city, uh, but, but also produce a more representative democracy in, in the long run. So definitely want to yield back my time if you have any questions. I am a member of the League of Women Voters here in the San Bernardino area. Uh, we're a nonpartisan organization, meaning we don't support or oppose uh, political candidates or political parties. We just simply take positions on issues, and one of those positions that we support is, is ranked choice voting. That's pretty much what we've had, is ranked choice voting. Not, ne not necessarily. More or can, less. Not necessarily. So in the current, uh, current system, like in the most recent election, voters could uh, vote. There was two seats that were up, is my understanding mm -hmm. correct? And voters simply just said, well, I, wanna, I can only vote for two candidates. In the ranked choice voting system, it would give uh, voters the authority to rank their choices in order of preference, meaning that they could say, I like this candidate the best. This would be my first choice. I like this candidate the second best, second, and, and so on and so on. And in terms of how they uh, produce a winner, is essentially it's, it's also referred to as instant runoff voting. And essentially how they, how they produce the, 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 the winners is they count up all the first place votes first, and the can the, if there's no candidate that's received a majority support, the candidate with the least amount of first place votes is eliminated, but their, follow, their, their, their uh, subsequent ranked cho rank choices are redistributed to the remaining eligible candidates. So it's a little bit different, mm -hmm. um, but again, it is, it is one of the fastest sweeping voting rights expansions in the, in the country. 
uh, today, but it, that is what, what's unique about it is that it's actually supported by folks regardless of political ideology, um, which is ob obviously convincing uh, in terms that it's been adopted in conservative jurisdictions, moderate jurisdictions, and liberal jurisdictions, and it's really bringing folks together for the better for the betterment of all. Yeah. It, it, the the challenge with us, and it's not that we want we want the best system possible, and we. We, I don't, none of us here are in favor of where we're going with this, but CVRA does not specifically enumerate this. And our understanding is that there are some legal challenges. Is it Palm Desert or Palm Dale? Palm Desert. Palm Desert, that there's still some pending legal challenges. So that hasn't been 100% solidified is what we heard from our attorneys. So, I mean, that's a gamble on top of a gamble that we're already running that we could lose and, and the taxpayers in this city would be on the hook for a lot of money. Sure. So. Um, at the end of the day, we're just trying to well, trying I, to do the best thing that we can. Absolutely, and I'm, I'm really trying to really reach the consensus d decision. I don't, obviously would not want to push you in a, a situation where you're, you know, wait, you know, putting a lot of taxpayer money into that. Uh, what I would do, do hope is that if you do have any uh, inclinations in terms of the safe harbor provisions, if we can just put this on pause just a little bit longer. I know with the next meeting that we could, if we can look into this a little bit longer and obviously work in good faith with uh, the person that's with Shankman, uh, I do think that we can reach an agreeable agreeable situation for all under this, under this what, what is the precedent with Palm Desert, um, but also what's, what's, what's best for on the ground uh, as well. Okay. Thank Appreciate you. that, thank you. Mr. Uh, Courtney. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and others. I'm Phil Courtney. I'm a board member of the Californians for Electoral Reform. CIFR, we're on the internet. And uh, in the uh, deference to this meeting getting pretty late, I'm not gonna reinvent the wheel here with the comments that Mr. James Albert made, but I will urge you to seriously look in to his proposals um, and uh, do some research. Uh, you can find us on the internet, Californians for Electoral Reform. And um, it's, uh, thank you for allowing me to speak. And um, by the way, I'm a 2L Phil too. Ah, right on. Um, do you have a quick explanation how that came about? I, I'll spare you my story, but how do, how do you happen to use 2Ls? <laughs> My, my father said, gave me some hokey story about, <laughs> uh, I don't know, two glasses of empty water and fill up the third. <laughs> I don't know. It was, it didn't make much sense. Sometime we'll discuss it, is it what with it is. a cup of coffee. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Oh, yeah, there you go. Maybe. <laughs> okay. Uh, decision is in front of us. Are you looking for a motion? Yes, unless there's further questions. Okay. Uh, I move Council Bill number R-2020-35 to adopt a resolution declaring the city's intent to transition from at-large elections to district-based elections for city council pursuant to election code section 10010. Second. Madam Clerk. The motion, the motion is to approve and adopt Council Bill R-2022-35, declaring the City Council's intention to transition from at-large elections to district-based elections for City Council pursuant to Election Code Section 10010. Councilman Jindal? Yes. Councilman Lenart? Yes. Councilman Rigsby? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Daly? Mayor Duper. Reluctantly, yes. <laughs> the item was approved unanimously. Okay, thank you very much. All right, we'll circle all the way back to <coughs> item number one on the agenda. Madam Clerk, I, I'm guessing this is something you're going to present. <laughs> um, this item is to confirm the June 7th, 2022 elections. I did receive yesterday from the San Bernardino County Register of Voters a certification of registry, regist register of voters of the results of the canvas of the June 7th, 
2022 statewide direct primary elections. Sorry. I did have this at the time I did the notice, but we did, I did receive the certification. So the recommendation by city council is to adopt council bill R-202234 confirming the June 7th, 2022 election results and approve the city clerk to administer the oath of office and present the certificate of election to our city councilman elect. Okay, proceed. I move council bill R-2022-34. Yes, we just I think there's precedent night. of not <coughs> certifying election results. It will cost thirty thousand if we don't do it. <sighs> Motion is to adopt Council Bill R-2022-34, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Loma Linda, California, reciting the fact of the general municipal election held on June seventh. 2022 declaring the results and such other matters as provided by law approve the oath of office to be administered and certificate of elections to be presented to the city councilman elect and to allow for comments from newly elected councilmen councilman jindal yes councilman lenart yes. councilman rigsby yes mayor pro tem daily i think we do Aye. and mayor duper yes item is approved Right. <laughs> so the next item, I would ask Councilman Duper and Daly to step down so we can do the oath of affirmation, allegiance. Although I don't know if I have it. So I ask both councilmen to raise your right hands. Do you, Philip Duper and Ron Daly, solemnly swear that you will support and defend the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that you will bear true faith and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California, that you take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion and that you will well and faithfully discharge the duties upon which you both are about to enter. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So I would have you each sign. Could you repeat that? And then I'll read the certificate of election. I, Lynette Aureolas, Clerk of the City of Loma Linda, State of California, do hereby certify that at a general municipal election held in said city on the seventh day of June 2022, Philip Duper and Ron Daly were elected to the office of, mem of member of the City Council as appears by the official returns of said election and the statement of votes cast now on file and in my office. Congratulations. So this is for Philip. And this is for Ron Daly. Thank you very much. I was just suggesting we skip the remarks if you want to. I, I think we're going to. <laughs> Go ahead, it was a hard fought battle. 
Uh, so moving on. All right, uh, item number two, reorganization. So we'll start out with the election of mayor. It has to be chaired by you because you're not the mayor anymore. So nominations are now in order for the office of mayor. I elect Councilman Phil Duper. I'll second the motion. I would be in favor of that too, and I'd like to stay with nominations. Good. Good job, Done a good job, Phil. Yep. All right, there's, okay, so that's closed. So there's um, no more nominations. So the nominations are closed. Um, we have a nomination for for um, Phil Duper for mayor. All those in favor, I will go through the vote. Councilman Jindal? Yes. Councilman Lennart? Yes. Councilman Rigsby? Yes. Councilman Daly? Aye. And Councilman Duper. I can't vote for myself. Do it. Uh, <laughs> okay. You yes. Tell, you gotta tell your wife you're unanimously elected. <laughs> <laughs> um, this I will make a comment on. Uh, you know, this is, this is all just ceremonial and I'm just very so so proud of the council that we have for all of you guys you guys are not only um, the greatest partners to work with but I also consider you all friends and I'm thankful for all of you and uh, it's just all of us together so anyway thank you very much for that thank you for all your hard work over the last few years it's been a lot of work although COVID really reduced the amount of speeches you had to Th make. this is true the first year really wasn't much yeah yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Okay. Moving on to B, 2B. Uh, do Is this your mayor? Okay. So we'll entertain uh, nominations for the position of mayor pro tem. saying that to me I don't like the position because I'm tired of explaining what it means <laughs> who hasn't done it yet have you done it I'll nominate uh, Ron Daly for another term. Second. Okay, any other nominations? Seeing none, we'll close it. Madam Clerk. Motion is to nominate Councilman Daly for, as Mayor Pro Tem. Councilman Jindal? Yes. Councilman Lennart? Yes. Councilman Rigsby? Yes. Councilman Daly? John's got a point about that whole unanimous. And Mayor Duper. Yes. Okay, the vote is unanimous to um, for Councilman Daly as Mayor Pro Tem. Okay, moving on to item number three, which are our um, assignments on boards and commissions. Can I try this again? I think I try it every two years. I'd like to make a motion that we take all items 3A to H and everybody continue in their current positions that they're holding now. Okay. Can we do that? So 3G is not an appointed position that we appoint right now. Right? Um, <clears throat> what's that? 3G? I don't, th I don't think we have a position on SCAG that we're allowed to even give out. I think we just appoint it's someone to, to attend to the, a meeting yeah, to not meeting. to be a voting member. So whatever current jobs we have is customized for. Okay. Unless somebody wants to give up a job or take a different job. So one question from my end. So um, I applied for SCAG's transportation committee. They're already filled, so that application went in too late. Um, I do want to do something in transportation. Um, 
slash supply chain because that's where my expertise is, uh, at formal education and my job. Um, so if there is a position for IVDA or SBIAA, the San Bernardino International Airport Authority, um, I would love to be a second on that. Uh, if you believe that you're doing um, important work and attending all the meetings, then I'm fine with that as well. Um, but if there is a opportunity, I would like to take one of those. I have never seen a meeting that we had a blank spot where nobody, where there was not either the primary or the secondary attending with the current attendees. You know, I have to confess, some of these I'm not even clear on who, I know, I know you've done SBCTA for a while. I've been on the trains for a while and I'm pretty engaged with that. Um, IVDA and, and the airport kind of work together. Are you doing that? It used to be OV, but I, I, I was on. I and Phil are the primary, secondary in whatever combinations there are. Okay, because IVDA, <coughs> we have two members, right? We have, we have and on IVDA, on we, have, we have, both of us are primaries, and I think John is okay. the, is is the, the alternate. alternate. For, and one, for IVDA. For IVDA. Yeah. And so airport is just one, Airport, right? I'm the primary, and Phil's the secondary. Okay. The, the way and that it's currently been moving is potentially Dusty or, or mm -hmm. I are gonna move into some yeah, higher I, roles at the airport. Yeah, and IBDA, I am so the- we probably shouldn't mess with that too much. I'm the, v, I'm the VP of the airport authority <coughs> currently and um, there are moves to advance one of us to leadership on IVDA. Is Mike, Tomorrow. Mike, Mike <laughs> still there? Yeah. Tomorrow is the election for IVDA. Do you want to stay as the alternate on IVDA? Um, yeah, okay. So then it's, it would just, the motion is just to keep everything the way it is. Um, it, is there a chance for you to get on SCAG? The nice positions round. are filled, but it's okay. Like I said, if you guys feel you're doing important work and attending all the meetings, then it's fine. Who does Confire? Is that you, Dusty? Uh, Dusty. Yeah, I've been on Confire for like 14 years. Who's, who's I'm the only continuity on, on Confire currently. We had Solace, Everybody Solace else, all management. the other board members on Confire have been there like two years. Who's solid waste? I don't know. Solid me. waste is, we always have said since I first was elected that solid waste uh, rolls downhill. Was the right place for you? It rolls downhill and it goes to the lowest seniority person on the, on the council. Yes. So there's a motion for continuity, and there was a second for continuity. No, it was just a motion. If if you're making a second, I'll second the continuity. Um, unless there's further discussion, we want to go ahead and move that with the motion to keep everything the same. You guys good with that, yep. Madam Clerk? Motion is to confirm the current to for the current appointments to remain as delegates and alternates for the boards and commissions. Councilman Jindal? Yes. Councilman Lenart? Yes. Councilman Rigsby? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Daly? Aye. Mayor Duper? Yes. That, pa the, that motion passed. Okay, thank you. Moving on to number seven, which is a public hearing on the cost of our spring weed abatement program. Evening, council members. My name is Matt Damon. I am the fire inspector here for the fire department, and I'll be presenting the report on the 2022 spring weed abatement season. So, for the spring 2022, the program began on March 28th and continued through the 31st. 
with an initial inspection of approximately 435 parcels. 162 notices to clean property were sent by regular mail on April 7th to the owner of record. We only had three letters returned to sender. Return notices were posted on the physical properties for the owner to record, and follow-up inspections were conducted between the 18th and the 19th of April. Uh, the com combustible vegetation and fire hazards were abated by the city contractor on 17 parcels. On June 20th, specifying costs of the work performed by the contractor plus the city's administrative fee were mailed to the owner of record for each parcel giving them the opportunity to make payment by today, July 12th. The list that remains unpaid, which you can see on Exhibit C, which I think that we've had two payments as of today, and it leaves us with 13 outstanding invoices. <coughs> it's recommended by the city that the city council receive the report, approve the report of the accounting costs, and adopt the accompanying resolution establishing liens and assessments on the properties outstanding. That concludes my report, and Thank I can you. take any questions that you'd like. I move to adopt Council Bill R-22. Isn't, isn't there a public hearing? Yeah, there's there's a public hearing. We just got to do real quick. But any any questions on it or? Okay. We'll open up the public hearing. Dick? No? Sure? Okay. Close the public hearing. All right. <clears throat> now we'll move it. Move Council Bill R-2022-33. Second, and uh, for the public, when we're abating weed, it's not what you're thinking. <laughs> Motion is to adopt resolution R-2022-33 to approve the report and the accounting cost and adopt the resolution establishing liens and assessments on the properties as submitted today. Councilman Jindal? Yes. Councilman Lenart? Aye. Councilman Rigsby? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Daly? Aye. Mayor Duper? Yes. The item passed. Thank you very much. Moving on to the consent calendar. Thank you. Move it. We have first. Second. And a second. Madam Clerk. Thank you. I'm sorry, I didn't get who made the motion. Oh, uh, okay. Dr. Rigsby. The motion to, is to approve the items on the consent calendar as submitted. Councilman Jindal? Yes. Councilman Lenart? Yes. Councilman Rigsby? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Daly? <clears throat> Mayor Duper? Yes. The items were approved as submitted. Thank you very much. We have nothing under old business. Uh, there were two items under new business, one we already dispensed with. Now we'll move to item number 16, city manager's contract. Yes, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, there is an existing contract that we have with the city manager, um, city manager Jarb, that was entered into on 2018, and it's a five-year contract, and we're four years into that. The proposed amendment is to extend that contract by three years, so uh, so that would be until 2026, uh, June 30, 2026. It also provides for an increase in compensation to the city manager as indicated in the agenda report, uh, which would be 4% for this fiscal year 4% for the following, 4% for the following, and then 3.5% for the fourth year. Um, so we would recommend that uh, you approve this amendment. The, the contract of 2018 contains all the benefits and, and other, uh, other matters. All of that remains the same. The only change is the length of the agreement and the amount of the compensation. Any questions? Move it. First. Second. 
And a second. Motion is to approve the amendment to the existing employment agreement with city manager T. Jarb Taipet, providing for an increase in compensation and, ex and an extension to the term of the employment agreement to June 30th, 2026. Councilman Jindal? Yes. Councilman Lenart? Yes. Councilman Rigsby? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Daly? Hi. Mayor Duper? Yes. The item is approved unanimously. Thank you, thank you very thank, much. Thank you. I, I really appreciate it and enjoy working with all of you. And uh, I have to get to keep my job for four more years. Thank you. <clears throat> Assuming your voice comes back. <laughs> okay, moving on to reports of council members. Seeing none or hearing none, reports of officers. I think we had something from the Sheriff's Department. Hello, Lieutenant Smith from the Sheriff's Department. I just would like to announce um, that we're gonna have National Night Out on Tuesday, August 2nd from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. at the Citrus Trails Park in Loma Linda. And we're extremely grateful for this opportunity to reach out to this new community. They have several neighborhood watch groups and they're, they're very active with us and we're very grateful for that. So if every, anybody wants to come by and see us, um, we also have the fire department will be there. So come on August 2nd. And it's uh, 6 to 8 p.m.? Yes, 6 to 8 p.m. Okay. So we appreciate it, thank you. Thank you very much. Any other officers? Seeing none. Do we have we flyer? There is, a, there is a flyer, yeah. Cool. Okay, seeing uh, nothing else, uh, we'll close the uh, city council agenda and move into the housing authority. We'll open the housing authority. Mr. City Manager, are there any items to be added or deleted? No, sir. Uh, there's only one item on the agenda, which is the consent calendar. Move it. We have a first and a second. <coughs> Madam Clerk. Motion is to approve the items on the consent calendar on the Housing Authority agenda. Councilman Jindal? Yes. Councilman Lenart? Yes. Councilman Rigsby? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Daly? Aye. Mayor Duper? Yes. The consent calendar was approved. Thank you very much. No new business. Any chair member reports? Reports of officers? Seeing none, we'll adjourn the uh, Housing Authority and we'll move into the successor agency. Mr. City Manager, any items to be added or deleted here? No, sir. Okay. Um, anyone from the public, and I missed it on the last one, anyone from the public wishing to speak on a non-agendized item for either this or the Housing Authority? Dick, are you sure? No? Okay. All right. Uh, seeing nobody, we're going to move on. Uh, do I have a first on the consent calendar? I move it. Too late. I moved it before he even announced it. He moved it before we even like said, it. Like he said, do you have a first? No, he said we have a first. <laughs> we have one. Do we have a second? Not yet, not yet. <laughs> oh, second. Okay, first and a second. Madam Clerk. Motion is to approve the consent calendar on the successor agency, as submitted. Councilman Jindal? Yes. Councilman Lenart? Councilman yes. Rigsby? Mayor Pro Tem Daly? Aye. Mayor Duper? Yes. The items are approved. Thank you very much. That concludes all of our agendas. Thank you for coming this evening. Lights are flickering. It's time to go home.